بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله نستعينه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي وقني شر نفسي وفلت لساني وان اضل 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 بغير حق رب العالمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته uh, i want to uh, begin uh, by uh, diffusing uh, any uh, explosive expectations that might have been generated by uh, mizan's little introduction there um, i'm uh, uh, actually in a very real sense not here to um, bring about any explosions. Um, I'm here to, uh, inshallah, share a perspective uh, and hopefully uh, benefit from the uh, intellectual and experiential capital uh, in this room. Um, there are ways in which um, we as Muslims in America and you as Muslims in Britain uh, share a, a common experience, and that is the experience of being minorities, uh, and not only minorities, um, but also minorities in predominantly non-Muslim societies. Um, and at the same time, <clears throat> the uh, differences uh, between America and Britain in terms of their constitution as uh, modern states um, and the historical narratives that inform them um, means that there are going to be very uh, meaningful differences between our experiences uh, here uh, and there. Um, I'm going to be talking, quite frankly, um, about my perspective on the challenges of being Muslims uh, in America. And uh, I hope that there will be uh, some overlap and some benefit that you may be able to derive uh, from my remarks in that regard. <clears throat> Um, before I proceed, I want to just apologize ahead of time because <clears throat> um, um, it turns out I've been sick ever since I got here in England, um, and uh, your English bugs are quite strong. Uh, in fact, I can't remember the last time I was actually this sick, so uh, I'm uh, just at the beginning uh, of hopefully what will be a recovery, and uh, so my voice is a bit... Uh, crackly and I'll probably burst out with calls from time to time so I just want to apologize ahead of time for that. Um, uh, one note of correction I think uh, in the last talk that I gave on Sunday I believe it was uh, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Ibn Sabirin as someone who was uh, uh, condemning the early Sufi um, practice of wearing woolen cloaks uh, as an imitation of Christian monks. Uh, that was an Ibn Sabirin. That should have been Ibn Sirin. Ibn Sabirin is somebody much, much later. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to correct that mistake. Um, let me begin by uh, trying to give you a sense of who I am. So, uh, and that way, uh, hopefully, you will be able uh, to place my remarks in a uh, ideational context that may actually enable you to understand what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to say. Um, let me begin by saying that um, as, a, as, a, as a thinker, as a Muslim, uh, a scholar, an intellectual, um, I do not consider myself to be uh, a liberal. Um, and I also uh, do not consider myself to be a conservative. Um, I, I think, like many, if not perhaps even most uh, Muslim thinkers in America, um, I'm in a real way still struggling to find a political slash intellectual identity that can effectively reflect my commitments and sensibilities as a Muslim in ways that neither falsely inflate nor falsely downplay my differences with others, particularly non-Muslims. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a, a huge challenge uh, in, in America because um, for people who have public statements about various and sundry things, um, the prisms through which those statements are routinely um, uh, 
processed um, tend to shunt them uh, in one of these categories or, or the other. Um, and if you are of neither of those persuasions, uh, oftentimes uh, your particular perspective can sort of get lost in a, an intellectual uh, no man's land. And so this is a, a huge challenge uh, for Muslims in America. But as I said, uh, I, 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 I don't consider myself a, a, a liberal or a, or a conservative. And I'll come back to saying something more substantive, substantive about that in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> I'm also uh, not a Sufi, um, and to say that I'm not a Sufi is not to say that I'm anti-Sufi. I'm not anti-Sufi either. Um, I'm one who believes in uh, taking that which is uh, beneficial from that tradition uh, and leaving that uh, which is not. Uh, finally, let me say um, that I'm also not a bigot, by which I mean that, um, to paraphrase a statement that's uh, attributed to various and sundry early ulama, I believe that I am right with the possibility that I am wrong. And I believe that those who differ with me are wrong with the possibility that they might be right. And what this means is that I try to remain open to dialogue and discourse and to being informed and enriched by the opinions uh, of others. Um, I, 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 I might recall in this regard a statement attributed to Imam al-Shafi'i uh, who once said that, you know, I never entered into uh, a debate with another individual except that quietly and secretly um, I wished that he would win. And the reason for that, he said, was that because if I win, uh, I don't benefit anything from the debate. I stay where I am in terms of my level of knowledge, but if I lose, I actually end up learning something. Even here, however, and having said this much, I want to rush to add that um, when I say that I believe I am right with the possibility that I am wrong, I'm talking here essentially about essential issues um, and things on which uh, uh, the Muslims the Muslim community has recognized a long-standing consensus. Um, when it comes to essential issues, um, many of these um, I would not even consider open to, uh, to debate. Um, and of course, and we'll probably get into this, this conversation, in this regard, um, it's not so much a question of, of right or wrong. Tawheed is the religion of the Muslims. Salat is five times a day. Uh, we fast Ramadan, etc., etc., etc. There are things in Islam that are a point of unanimous consensus, and there's really no point in debating them. And these are around the essentials of the religion. Outside this area, however, there are many issues that admit of multiple answers that while we might not consider them to be correct in the sense of having hit the target or the bullseye, as it were, they are certainly admissible in that they are grounded in sources and in methodologies of interpretation that the Muslim community itself have long recognized to be productive of answers that are recognizable at Islam. And this is the area in which um, when I say uh, I believe that I am right with the possibility that I'm wrong, my adversaries are wrong with the possibility that they are right, this is the area that I'm talking about. This is important to me because in my experience, one of the most devastating presumptions that Muslims have imbibed is that every issue admits of only a single correct answer and that all other answers are wrong, and that their advocates simply lack knowledge or religiosity or both. They're either ignorant or they're not serious about Islam. This is another corollary, or this is a corollary to another problem of perception in the Muslim community, in my experience, and that is the lack of distinction 
between primary and secondary issues. On this oversight, i.e. on this lack of distinction, all issues become primary issues. And there remains no room for difference, no room for difference of opinion or diversity. And this is a necessary outcome of the inability or refusal to distinguish primary usul from secondary furu'i issues. <clears throat> now, one can imagine the very devastating effects that this can have on a communal presence. Because if there is no room uh, for debate, um, there is no room for discussion, then what we end up doing is living under a sort of self-imposed totalitarianism. Not a totalitarianism that is overseen by some external power, but a totalitarianism that comes of the very idea that we are not afforded enough recognition to engage our own faculties on various and sundry issues. To the, to the extent that all we can do is sort of be quiet, follow what we perceive to be the, the party line, and in that will lie our safety and our ability to exist in our communities. This has an absolutely devastating effect on our communal order. And I think that to a large degree, this is behind what I have noticed among many young people, um, particularly in an American context. And that is to say, there are many young people who consider themselves to be believing, practicing Muslims. They have no doubt about Allah, his messenger, any of the essentials of the religion, five pillars, etc. And yet, they are scared to death of the communal order of, of Islam. They're scared to death, in a sense, of their religion. They're scared of Muslim collectivities uh, because they feel that these collectivities don't allow them ample space in which to breathe and in which to explore and in which to come to conclusions that they themselves might actually be able to internalize and process on their own. And I think, again, this whole sort of toxic atmosphere has a lot to do with our inability or refusal to separate primary from secondary issues. And I think this is a very important point, especially for those of us who are living as Muslim minorities in Western societies, is a very important, po important point for us to observe. Because I think that we, as Muslim minority communities, will be faced with, will be confronted with many issues that are unprecedented uh, in the history of Islam in the world. Um, and while our fiqh tradition may be our point of departure, we ourselves will have to exercise agency in getting that tradition to speak effectively to the circumstances that confront us. And if we don't have the ability to come together and exchange ideas and argue points of view um, in a manner that does not absolutely debilitate us, then that exchange won't take place. And we are not likely to benefit the maximum that we can from our communities. <clears throat> this inability to sustain civil and serious debate and exchange um, in a religious context is to me um, quite sad. And it's sad because one of the major facets of the genius of Islam. And this is something that has been recognized even by non-Muslim scholars who have studied the history of Islam. 
one of the signatures of Islam's genius was that here was a religion, a religion that successfully accommodated difference of opinion and promoted intellectual freedom among its adherents. Um, many Muslims today, this might sound like, you know, sort of romantic, uh, just another romantic Muslim sort of recollection of some grand and glorious Muslim past. But to say what I said is not to say that there are not sad chapters in Muslim history, that there weren't instances in which this particular standard was not lived up to. But the reality is, is the following. Just imagine this. You have a religion in which you have four schools of fiqh, four. And within each of them, any number of differences, all of which recognize each other as equally orthodox and as equally authoritative. And that these four schools of law, in fact, as one scholar put it, the madhab turns out to be the most permanent institution in Islam. And so while you get a political history that goes like this, you know, you have Umayyads, Abbasids, Buwayhids, uh, you know, uh, Seljuks, uh, Ayyubids, Mamluks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and yet, you have what? These four schools just continuing all along. All right? They're able to sustain these differences of opinion, recognizing the possibility of more than one correct answer on many, many issues. Right? And this, and this is the real point to be made here, is all within the context of a religious civilization. The fact of the matter is, is that it could be argued that had this particular ability on the part of religion to accommodate different points of view and various opinions had that existed in Europe, then perhaps the, the history of Europe and therefore the world would have been different with regard to the position that religion finds itself in today. Because it was precisely the sense that religion cannot tolerate difference of opinion. It cannot accommodate debate. It cannot bring itself to a position of tolerance that has led to the idea that religion, therefore, needs to be marginalized. It needs to be removed from public life because it can only bring destruction, division, and a lack of community to public life. And yet, that ability to accommodate more than one position in a religion, more than one school of thought, more than one way of doing things. And by the way, I mean, we're talking from, from Adhan, many of us might not know this, all right? Uh, the Maliki Adhan is not like other schools Adhan. The Maliki, my Maliki. I hope that's okay, <laughs> inshallah. Uh, the Maliki Iqama, it's not like other, you find the Malikis will pray like this, not all of them. You follow my, but from basic things like prayer, all right? Um, we can accommodate this, okay? We don't think that that's the right way. We think this is the right way, hmm? But they have their delil. They have their delil. And it's based on what? Sources and methods of interpretation that we do recognize, right? It's like they say that Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was approached once. Imam Ahmed is of the opinion that a nosebleed invalidates one's wudu. So they asked him, they said, Imam Ahmed, what do we do 
if we're praying behind an imam who has a nosebleed and doesn't renew his wudu. Imam Ahmed paused for a minute and then he said, hmm, hmm, I see your point. But how could I refuse to pray behind the likes of Imam Malik and Sa'id ibn Musayyib? These are men who are just as knowledgeable as I am, just as pious as I am, just as committed as I am. They would not hold this opinion if it was not based on something that they saw as valid. Hmm? This is one of the missing elements in our modern Muslim existence. And for some reason, we have arrived at a point where it, there's almost this thirst for the one right answer. Every time a question comes up, we want what one right answer. The situation cannot admit of more than that. And I think that if we look at this phenomenon in historical context, it may be beneficial to us to ask us where this comes from. Because most of us think of ourselves in this regard as being truer to Islam than the opposite. And yet, I would suggest that this impulse could not have come from Islam. Which leaves the question, where did it come from? Now, I have some ideas, but perhaps we can save those um, for, the, for the question uh, and answer period. Perhaps I'll just say right now that I think that maybe the manner by which we have, have all been socialized and, and conditioned by the reality of the modern state uh, may have something to do with this. Because in the context of a modern state, uh, there's always at any one time one law, one law that regulates all issues. And if we're, if we're, if we're, if we're socialized in that, in that, in that context, uh, it may not be long before we internalize uh, the impulse to demand the same thing of Islam. One law, one hukum, one point of view to recognize everything. Now, um, I want to get into some of the concrete challenges that I see um, confronting Muslims as minorities um, in the West, but again, with special focus on America. Um, but before I do that, I want to return for a moment to the themes of liberalism and conservatism with which I opened. Um, because the reality is, is that this issue, certainly in an American context, is nowhere near as cut and dried as I may have uh, led you to think by my previous comments. When it comes to liberalism, and I said that I'm not a liberal, but when I say that I'm not a liberal, um, I, I, I don't want to give the impression that there is nothing uh, in liberalism um, that I find of value. The reality is that while liberalism has destroyed much of the stable foundations for any morality that is grounded in the transcendent, such as the reality of Muslims who believe that values come from, from transcendent God, it is precisely in this capacity that liberals will often defend Muslim rights. In fact, uh, many of the uh, uh, opportunities uh, and possibilities uh, that, that we enjoy today um, are in some very meaningful ways um, products of uh, the liberal effort to establish a, a liberal society. So for example, in America, the substance of any moral argument is increasingly substituted by the principle of equality. In other words, we'll look less to the substance of what this particular group or individual is arguing and more to 
whether or not that group is being treated equally with other groups. Since in terms of substance, we cannot make an objective uh, uh, judgment, because as I said, much of the foundation for transcendent moral judgments has been destroyed. And therefore, rather than judge the substance, we'll simply judge whether or not these individuals or this group is being treated in a way that is equal compared to others. This, incidentally, is largely the legal argument buttressing such things as the push for gay rights, including things like, like gay marriage. Now, morally, Muslims find these kinds of things reprehensible. But what position, and this is one of the challenges that we confront, what position do Muslims adopt in a context in which arguments about equality are likely to gain Muslims' rights to do things that they believe that they should or must do as Muslims, while at the same time, that principle extended to others are going to give them rights to do things that Muslims themselves find morally reprehensible. That's one of the problems with liberalism, and that's part of the promise with liberalism. So for example, uh, it's early in the morning, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sweating. I'm, thank you. I'm still getting over a fever. Um, I had a, a conversation with a, uh, no, this is water, it's fine. I had a conversation with a, uh, a, uh, a prominent Muslim leader in, in America. And uh, he mentioned to me that um, he wished that Muslims outside America understood that the Muslim right to practice polygyny, for example, in America is likely, if it comes at all, to be an extension of all these things that are going on with gay rights right now. On the principle, the liberal principle of equality. Does everybody follow, follow that argument? And so here you end up in a position where the means by which you enhance your own position may also enhance the position of others with whom you fundamentally disagree. Now, my personal opinion, and I'll give it here, um, is that what I want as a Muslim is the ability to carve out and live a dignified existence for me as a Muslim. To be able to do the things that I need to do, to avoid the things that I need to avoid as a Muslim. And if the provisions that bring me the ability to do that also happen to empower others to do things with which I morally disagree, then so be it, within certain limits, of course. To me, part of the precedent here would go back, actually, to the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what we find, for example, in what is, what is uh, routinely referred to as the Constitution of Medina. After all, the Constitution of Medina stipulates what? That Medina will function as a place 
of peace for all of the inhabitants of Medina. And that the entire city agrees to protect that city from all foreign invaders. Not only that, that within the city, if any one party or group unjustifiably attacks any other party or group, the entire city is bound to do what? To beat back the aggressor. Now, this is an arrangement, of course, that will empower the Muslims to do what? <coughs> to go about the business of building their Muslim community. At the same time, who else was in Medina at this time? Jews were in Medina. Who else? Mushrikeen, the polytheists, Arabs, the majority, all right? And yet, this arrangement was one with which the prophet himself agreed to. In other words, yes, that would empower them to do things that Islam would disagree with. But the operative element in this treaty, or in this constitution, as it were, was that it would empower Islam and Muslims to build their community. And it's a very interesting thing that um, with regard to Medina as a city itself, Medina was largely won, not conquered. The Medinese largely converted. Uh, this was not through uh, wars and battles per se. So that's something uh, to think about. Conservatism also um, has its, its, its positive side and its, its negative side. Um, for, for conservatives, conservatives tend to honor uh, the transcendent foundations of morality. But mainly from a Christian perspective. In other words, to honor transcendent foundations for morality um, is, if that morality is, is Christian. Of course, there is some overlap between Christian and Muslim morality. Um, if you don't believe that, just ask some converts um, and they'll, they'll tell you that. There is some overlap between Christian and Muslim morality. Um, but where this ends, that is where the overlap ends, conservatives tend to be far less recognizing of Muslim rights, uh, at least the more vocal and extreme among, among conservatives. In fact, in America, um, the Islamophobia industry is largely backed and funded by conservatives. Right? And so you can see where, on the one hand, while in terms of values, and morality, etc., cetera, um, Muslims may have more in common uh, with, with conservatives. In terms of the political realities on the ground, um, conservatives are a problem, all right? Um, where Muslims um, may differ fundamentally with, with liberals on, on issues of morality, um, in terms of politics on the ground, um, liberals are often the ones who will um, come out in favor of, of Muslim rights. And so we have this, this, uh, this, this problem in America. And this is one of the reasons why for people like me it's, it's, uh, it's so difficult to sort of arrive at uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an intellectual, uh, uh, political identity uh, with which one is comfortable. All right, so I've laid that out. I want now... Um, to move into what I believe to be um, some of the concrete uh, challenges um, that confront Muslims as minorities in the West. And I think what I'll do is I'll start with what strike me to be uh, sort of the, the mega uh, challenges, um, and then I'll later on try to um, shrink the camera lens a bit to uh, 
uh, uh, to deal more specifically with some of the intramural challenges uh, within the Muslim community. Now, for me, um, the first challenge that uh, confronts Muslims in America is the challenge of belongingness. And by belongingness, I mean establishing a position in the American collective psyche, indeed in the American collective narrative, in which Muslims cannot be alienated from America. By which I mean, that Muslim critiques of America, Muslim suggestions for America, Muslim analyses of America are not perceived to be foreign hostile attempts to destroy but can be perceived as the right of any American to critique, analyze, and participate in the national conversation about what it means to be an American. And the reason that this uh, is so important, and this may be May, I'm not sure, I don't know very much uh, about England, other than you have some really nasty bugs here. Uh, but it, it may be one of the differences between America and England that, you see, part of what will determine the future of Muslims and Islam in America and Muslims' ability to carve out a dignified existence in America will be the Muslim success or failure at contributing to the very definition of what it means to be American. If the definition that settles in the collective psyche of Americans is one that excludes Islam and Muslims, then Muslims themselves, oh, I thought that was, okay. Uh, the, the, the Muslims themselves will not be in a position where they can exercise agency in terms of what it means to be an American. And all of this has concrete, direct meaning for such things as assimilation and domestication of religion. Assimilation will be the only course if America is defined by someone else and America's cultural, political, social orthodoxy is defined by that someone else. And Muslims who want to live in America <clears throat> find themselves in a position where to be accepted is either to assimilate to that prefabricated definition of what it means to be American or to be alienated as outsiders. Part of my concern for Muslims as minorities is that, again, they take the agency to define the countries in which they live. 
and not allow those countries to be defined by those who would want to exclude Muslims from what it means to be members in that country. And for me, this, this concern goes back uh, a number of years. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was in the Muslim world. I don't know, I should, probably shouldn't mention names, huh? No. No, 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 no. Uh, I was in the Muslim world, and I was having a conversation with a, a, a very, uh, very prominent Muslim scholar. Uh, if I said his name, you'd all know who, who he was. But I don't want to say names, because I don't know how this will play out. And then if you hate me, then you'll hit him as well. And but uh, we were having this conversation, and he kept saying to me, you know, you Muslims in America, you have to stop this business of allowing your juz'iyat to overrun your kulliyat. You have to stop allowing your juz'iyat to overrun your kulliyat. You have to stop allowing your juz'iyat hmm, to overrun your kulliyat. And he kept saying this. I mean, this is like a three hour conversation. I'm to oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He said, you have to stop allowing concrete individual rules or even hadith or even ayat Qur'aniya from overrunning the broader aims. Some people call them higher. Now I call them broader aims and objectives of Islam. All right? Um, it's, for example, uh, if you are dying of hunger and there's nothing there to eat but a pork chop, what do you do? But eating pork is what? What he was saying is that the ulama have defined a number of what they call kulliyat, kulliyat al-khams, the five broader aims and objectives of sharia. And they are preservation of life, preservation of religion, progeny, <laughs> property, and sanity. All right? And some add dignity. All right? And what they say is that any time an individual rule Juz'i, all right, threatens to overrun one of these kul, kuliyat, broader aims and objectives, all right, we invoke the broader aim and objective over that individual rule, all right? And he kept saying this and saying this and saying this. And of course, I was very familiar with the language. Um, this is standard language of Usul fiqh. Anybody who's studied usul fiqh knows, knows this language. I was very familiar with the language, but somehow it just didn't, didn't it wasn't sinking in. Um, and then it finally occurred to me that the reason that this is not quite sinking in is that we in America, we have not established any kulliyat. We don't have any kulliyat, any broader aims and objectives against which to weigh the application, right? By the way, these kulliyat, they do not deal with the substance of the rule. In other words, the, 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 the prohibition on eating pork remains valid. It's simply not applied in this particular circumstance. Does everybody understand that, that, that distinction, all right? We don't have any, any kulliyat with which we can weigh the application of, of the religion. And when that happens, two things are likely to occur. Either people would just go to crass pragmatism, which is a slippery slope, or people will apply things in ways that will actually bring harm to the community, and that too 
will be a slippery slope. And I began to think about this, and I, 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 I recalled uh, something that I can mention medieval scholars, right? Because uh, something that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah said, and there have been others who said it as well. Ibn Taymiyyah said that the scholars have extracted these kuliyat primarily from a reading of Islamic penal law. Right? So they've said things like the fact that the Quran sanctions execution for murder, all right, informs us of the value that Allah places on human life. All right? Uh, the fact that it authorizes jihad, all right, informs us of the value of protecting the religion. All right? Uh, if someone steals, all right, there's a ruling for that. And the punishment is what? Amputation of the hand. What does that suggest? That people's property, all right, is a value, is a broader aim and objective that the Quran, that Allah wants to preserve. When Ibn Taymiyyah says, this is okay, but why limit ourselves to criminal law as the place from which we derive these broader aims and objectives. And he goes on to argue that there could ostensibly be more broader aims and objectives. And this requires a constant and deep, assiduous reading of the sources of Islam. And one of the things that, you know, that I arrived at is that all of the prophets Salam, who came to their societies, they all belonged. And that was a fundamental part of their success or their ability to communicate with their people. In fact, if we read in Surah Al-A'raf, for example, and other places in the Quran, it is often spoken in their behalf that they declare to their people that what? We are sincere to you. We want what is best for you. All right? The Quran even calls them what? To their societies? Ah. Huh? Their brother. Okay? Um, and this to me represents the importance especially for those who have a religious message for society, of belonging. How can you deliver a message to a people to whom you don't belong? How can you participate constructively, effectively, successfully in a national debate among a people to whom you don't belong? How can you avoid alienation from a society, all right, to which you don't belong, right? What is going on in American society today? I don't know. You can tell me if something similar is happening in Britain. I don't know. What is going on in American society today is that anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic groups are very assiduously crafting sort of definitions of what it means to be American that explicitly or implicitly excludes Muslims. And, and, and politicians even find this, some politicians, not all, politicians even find this a very useful tool for um, whipping up the sentiments of their base, all right? And what this translates into, even subliminally, is 
a sense that many Americans get that to be anti-Muslim is actually to be patriotic. And for those of us who are tough guys like myself, and who say, who cares what they think about you? Um, let me uh, share something. Uh, my wife just sent me uh, over the email an incident that happened in New York City uh, what's today, the first? Yeah. On the 29th of December. So that was Saturday? Yeah. Saturday. An Indian man from India. So if you imagine, if you're in America, that could have been probably any of these people in this room. <laughs> now, I'm very serious about this. This is very serious. This is very serious. is standing on the subway platform. A woman pushes him in front of the train. And when she was caught and arrested, she said, I've hated Muslims and Hindus since 9-11. Now, you have to imagine all right? Um, this kind of sentiment, right? Taking root and spreading. Okay? And you have to imagine if they're not <coughs> groups and elements in society, all right, that will come out and speak against this kind of thing. In other words, the psychological challenge that is posed by this is real and serious enough. But there's also a physical challenge, all right? People can lose their lives. Muslims become targets of publicly directed violence. What's even more troubling about this particular incident is that the woman who did this was actually a Latina. Now, Another minority, in other words. All right? And so what you have is, potentially, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm just speculating here. Minorities beginning to identify with an Islamophobic rhetoric that translates into forms of patriotism, all right, that can actually animate these kinds of actions. All right? And this, again, to me, is part of the importance of Muslims belonging in America. Now, having said that much, let me, let me make it very clear here that, and this is another way in which America might be different from Britain. Should I call it England or Britain or because I was listening to you guys in the car the other day, it's like, I was thoroughly confused. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry? <laughs> so, UK. UK, all right, that's safe, UK. America is primarily a political arrangement. It is not a culture. There is no constitutionally mandated culture in America. What particularly some on the right and those who are most Islamophobic today are trying to do is to sort of establish a constitutionally mandated culture that excludes Islam, right? But the importance of this point here is that for me to say, oh, that's it? No, no, oh. For me to say that I belong in America, that belongingness 
is to a political arrangement. It is not one that spells agreement with American policy, American foreign policy, any number of American laws. Uh, it does not imply that at all. And by the way, you don't have to be a Muslim to disagree with all these things about America. All right? Uh, Non-Muslims disagree with American foreign policy all the time. Non-Muslims disagree with American uh, domestic policy all the time. Uh, Non-Muslims are running to courts to protest this, that, and the other all, all the time. And so I think it's important, especially among Muslims, because this is one of the stumbling blocks that we have had in America. And those who have come to America from without have in some ways exacerbated this because they have understood belonging to America, all right, to mean that one belongs to values, a culture, a social order that is at variance with Islam. It does not mean that at all, all right? But it is important if Muslims want to be able to affect any of that for them to belong. Because non-belongers, if that's a word, will not be able to affect any of that. <coughs> any of that. And, you know, you have to think about this, please, brothers and sisters, in the context of trying to raise children and families in these societies. Uh, I have seen the effects of Islamophobia uh, and what it has exerted on adult Muslims. Uh, you must imagine then the psychological, emotional pressures on Muslim children. And even if you have your so-called Muslim schools, all right, they will eventually come out of them and go to college. All right? Where the challenges will, will remain. So for me, one of the major, major, yes, yes, uh, the major challenges is the challenge of belonging. Because when I come to debate with non-Muslims about this, that, or the other in America, I want to debate as an equal, not as someone who is asking permission to be heard, not as someone who recognizes that, well, I'm really out of place here, or I'm asking for a favor, but someone who is an equal, who has an equal right to participate in and to inform what it means to be American. Um, Related to this whole business of uh, belongingness is um, another uh, enormous challenge that uh, we confront as, as Muslims in America. And um, I want to basically say as a um, prelude to this uh, point um, that you know, there may be realities that we are very uncomfortable uh, with facing, but the realities are what they are. And they don't go away simply by virtue of the fact that we don't confront them. Um, they remain, um, and the issues they bring along with them remain. Um, related to this business of belonging in America is the whole business of how Muslims relate to the U.S. Constitution. Now, why is this an issue? Among the major issues raised by the Islamophobia industry, let us call it, in America, is that Muslims in America are here 
for one reason, and that is to destroy, <laughs> I'm very serious, to destroy America and to replace the Constitution with Sharia. That is a prominent narrative. And I don't know, you've probably heard about this. There are something on the order of uh, about 22, and I've heard from some people 27, states, all right? There are only 50 states in America, all right? That's roughly half of them who have had anti-Sharia legislation put before their legislative bodies. They want to pass laws in America that either ban any Sharia dictates or provisions from being recognized by any American court, or some would even go to the extent of criminalizing criminalizing any practices grounded in Sharia. This is part of the narrative. Now, I think that rather than speak here in terms of abstractions, we have to look at the provisions of a constitution particularly if, as I claim, America is a political order, a political arrangement. The U.S. Constitution has, I don't think you have this in England, has, that's, you have a constitution, but so this is all foreign to you guys. Let me skip this then. <laughs> Well, th this, is, this is a major, major issue in America. But let me put it this way. The US Constitution, among the things that it stipulates, is a constitutionally mandated right to freedom of religion. That is the First Amendment. The First Amendment stipulates that America will not be a country with an established state religion. You can't do that. Nor, however, will it prevent the free exercise of religion. So for example, what has gone on in places like France or Switzerland could never happen in America. You could never have a ban on hijab in America by the Constitution. You could never ban minarets. Qua minarets, you understand what I mean by that? I mean, it, no, no, but, but I mean qua minarets. You can't ban it because it's a minaret. If it's some kind of obstruction or there's some zoning or, or something like that, that's a different story, you understand what I mean? But because it's a minaret, you could never do that in America, all right, as part of the constitutional provision, all right? Um, um, there are all kinds of reasonable accommodation clauses and things like that um, that flow from that constitutional provision. So you cannot discriminate against Muslims qua Muslims. You have to find very imaginative ways to do that, all right? You know, all of this is a part of the constitutional provision. And I think that the biggest stumbling block for many Muslims, ideolog uh, ideologically, is the idea that the Constitution is itself a man-made provision. I think that here um, we get into... Um, something of, of a sort of, of, of an oversight, or perhaps not an oversight, the idea that 
man-made law and Sharia are binary opposites is, to my mind, a modern phenomenon. The idea that man-made law and Sharia are binary opposites is largely a modern phenomenon. Now, I want to be clear in what I mean by that. <coughs> if you go back to classical Islamic law, and I'll use just one example or two maybe, just to be brief, and you look at provisions on things like ta'zir, ta'zir, right? What is ta'zir? Ta'zir are non-prescribed punishments. Do you understand what I mean by that? That's another way of saying what? Man-made. The idea that man-made was necessarily only for the purpose, all right, of getting rid of divine, that it's not there. Do you understand what I mean by that? But you, Ibn Taymiyyah, all right, in Siyash Sharia, all right, is promoting this Siyash Sharia, all right, discretionary powers on the, on the part of the state, all right, to aid and enhance huh, the integrity of Sharia. Does everybody understand what, I'm, what I mean by that? All right? In other words, you don't understand what I mean by that? In other words, where you have Sharia provisions that might be of a fashion that people can abuse them and the outcome could be injustice. Hmm? Ibn Taymiyyah says we need to grant rulers and judges more discretionary leeway, all right, in order to be able to supplement the law in ways that will prevent these injustices. Hmm? My point is that man-made did not always mean anti-God. And there was this nexus in pre-modern Islam between the two. In modern times, man-made comes to be the antonym of divine law. They come into to, 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 to direct clash. And in that context, it's understandable that Muslims might adopt this kind of attitude toward anything man-made. Um, I would offer that we resist this sort of knee-jerk reaction and examine the provisions of this particular man-made law and to see the extent to which it enhances, it accommodates, it enables the practice of Islam or not. Okay? Um, and it's in this context that I believe that Muslims should be looking at this whole business of the American Constitution. Because if, if Muslims in America, you don't have this problem in England, so I'm going to stop right here and go on to the next one. But if Muslims, wait a minute. Yeah, I, I know that, but okay. But my point is that if Muslims are diffident on this issue, it is going to enhance the ability of those who argue that Islam can be nothing but a threat here in America. It's going to enhance the ability to make those arguments believable. And my point is that 
Muslims should not, on purely pragmatic grounds, i.e., because they're scared or because they want to be accepted, they should not simply adopt a position that is in favor of the Constitution. Muslims have to ground their articulations in their own sources and their own methodologies of interpretation. I believe that we can do that, right? But this is one of the challenges that we as a Muslim minority in a place like America will face. Third, these are, these are really um, loaded. What was I thinking when I wrote these? Sheesh. All right. Um, third, <clears throat> I believe that Muslims have to get clear in their minds lest they fall into some very nasty traps. The distinction between secular and secularism. Secularism certainly in an American context is basically an ideology that says this life is the only life there is. There is no life beyond this. And therefore, the only considerations that are admissible in public discourse are considerations that are drawn from the experiences, the thought, the insights, and have an impact on this life. And there is no other life to be concerned about. Secular, on the other hand, is simply to recognize that there are things in existence that do relate to this life and that are subject to change and modification over time and space and that even revelation does not address all of these directly. And Muslim communities in real time and space are left with the obligation to address these secular issues imbued, of course, with the principles, sensibilities, and God consciousness of Islam, but to recognize them as this worldly issues. Now, what's the importance of this? Number one, Muslims are often paralyzed out of key debates because the debates are over issues that are quote unquote secular or not explicitly Islamic. That's number one. Oh, okay. Number two, this confusion between the secular and the secularism <coughs> gives non-Muslims the impression that there is such a thing as Islamic traffic laws or Islamic immigration policy. And therefore, there is nothing to talk to Muslims about these things. Everything is set in stone. That's Islam. All right? Muslims then end up paralyzed, 
not able to engage these issues. Um, and oftentimes, we'll sit out the debate. And all of those things will therefore be determined by whom? Someone else. Now, I want to be clear here. Please understand this distinction that I'm making between secularism and secular. If we are to set a speed limit, what will that be set on the basis of? Hmm? Empirical evidence, public safety. Uh, at what speed do cars, can you drive cars that, that they're safe, that people can control them, et cetera, et cetera. This is all secular logic. Not secularism, but what? Secular logic. And that might differ from what? Place to place, time to time. All right? My point here is that if Muslims don't understand this, they will take themselves out of many important national debates that have an impact on them. I'll give you an example. You don't have this problem in Britain, I've come to learn, because you have uh, national health care, right? Well, we don't have that in America. Uh, and there are health care debates you know, that go on and go on and go on. What's the Islamic health care policy? Do we enter this with an eye to what is going to be most beneficial to us and the broader community? Or do we simply say, it's not an Islamic issue. We don't deal with it. All right? And my point here is that so many issues in society, so many issues, all right, from licensing doctors, all right, to the room capacity of this room, I mean, to all all kinds of things in society are of this nature, all right? And if Muslims sit out these debates, all of these things will be determined by someone else. And yet, Muslims will live according to the dictates of those determinations. This business of secular versus secularism has to remain clear in the Muslim mind so that the Muslims are not paralyzed out of debates in which they should be involved. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a concrete example of this. Uh, in America, uh, there is this, uh, or there has been this debate over what is called affirmative action. Anybody? Hmm? Do Muslims have anything to say about this? Yeah. Yeah, I, one individual, no, I'm, I'm not, that's not patting myself on the back, that's not my point. But my point is, these are profound, far-reaching issues, right? But it's saying, on, on this, because they're secular issues, Muslims aren't engaging with them as Muslims, and you could see we get a Muslim on one side of the debate and a Muslim on the other of side. Of course. So, so what does it mean that Muslims need to engage as sort of these issues? They would be anyway. Well, if you, if you, number one, I think that the issue of engaging, uh, the issue is not always winning. The issue is presence and influence. Because ultimately, that kind of involvement presents you as a community whose sensibilities, whose interests, and whose concerns have to be measured. Um, out of sight, out of mind. And make no mistake about it, much of Islamophobia, that's what it's designed to do, to discourage Muslims from being involved in any kind of public debate. And so you're right, absolutely. The fact that Muslims get involved um, <coughs> is not going to guarantee this, that, or the other, or the other output or outcome, I should say. But it remains important for Muslims to understand that I do have a stake in this. 
I do have a stake in the direction of society, and I do, I do have, I won't call it an obligation, but a calling, let us say, to participate in those kinds of debates. Um, in the case of affirmative action, um, um, you know, I'll say this, although I was going to save it for later, but if we're not careful as a Muslim community in America, the one natural ally that we have had as Muslims, which was the black community, and the black community to Muslims has functioned sort of like Benny Hashem to the Prophet, i.e., I'm talking about pagan Benny Hashem, i.e., we don't necessarily agree with you, Muhammad, but you still are one of us, and we will protect you against them. Um, the black community have sort of functioned like that, but when you have major issues like affirmative action with far-reaching impact on the overall black community and no Muslim voices, all right, this is the kind of thing that, be that can begin to undermine that relationship. All right? And it can have very, very far-reaching uh, implications. And again, you know, Muslims may engage it and come out against. I mean, that, that's, that's fine. Even if it's not fine, it's fine. If you understand what I mean by that. But to be paralyzed, just not able to engage because you're paralyzed. <clears throat> that's what I'm arguing is the problem. And we have to overcome that. And I think that sometimes recognizing the distinction between secular and secularism can help us, under, uh, help us overcome that, that paralysis. That's my point. Um, the third, fourth big challenge, we got to stop now? About seven more minutes. Huh? About seven, more seven more minutes. minutes. Seven. Seven. Should I speak real fast? <laughs> um, we have a number of intellectual slash theological challenges uh, in, in America. Um, and I, I, I think that this is an area where uh, there, there, there's likely to be some, some overlap between uh, America and, and, and UK. Um, the, the first challenge here, I think, is uh, the, the, the challenge of, of epistemology. The, Secular academies of the West, i.e. the colleges and universities, are the repositories of a secular and indeed, in many ways, secularizing epistemology. And uh, perhaps a shorthand way of describing them is to say that if you believe in God, you have something to explain. If you don't believe in God, you don't have anything to explain. Um, and what we have is a situation where our young people are sitting in these institutions, internalizing, being saturated with this epistemology, and then coming out on the other side with the need then to try to reconcile Islam with a hardwiring now that militates not only against Islam but religiosity, period. All right? Um, and this is not just theory here. Uh, I know of young. Muslims, um, and not just in the humanities, throughout, throughout the educational system who are reeling at the way in which their faith is shaken, all right, by their existence in, in the academy. And Muslims themselves, we have yet to develop 
alternative institutions that could provide antidotes or at least insulation uh, from these dereligionizing, that's a word, uh, epistemologies, all right? Which, if you're talking about a community that's going to be going to college and putting itself in a position where it can sustain and support its own future, I mean, it's not going away. Um, this is a major, major issue and a problem uh, in the West, I would argue. And I think that it is, it is perhaps ignored sometimes because the temporary, I would call it, um, safe gap is for Muslims to recede into a sort of cultural, uh, ethnic religiosity, if, if that makes sense. I mean, I mean, you know, my religion becomes my, my, my cultural identity. You know, I go back to my Pakistani roots, which, from which Islam is inextricable, and that, that will sustain me, uh, despite the fact that my mind no longer clicks uh, with that. Um, and this enables us to, I think, ignore this problem for a while. Um, certainly for those of us who are going to uh, have and raise children in the West, this is not sustainable. This is not sustainable. And I think this is a problem uh, to which we are going to have to devote uh, more attention, serious attention. And this is going to demand some serious institution building uh, on our part, because I don't think this problem is going away. And, uh, the academy, the university system, is an enormously important institution in the West. Enormously important institution in the West. It shapes sensibilities across the board. And this is a problem I think that we would be ill-advised uh, to ignore. Second, I'll just do these two, three and I'll stop. That, was that seven minutes already? Yeah, seven minutes. Wow. Yeah. All right, well, then I'll, I'll, I'll behave. I have two more, and then I'll move on to the next one. Yeah, I'm on to another point now, so... No, no, it's... Are you, the, 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 are you finishing off? Well, I'm finishing off... Well, okay. The three points are epistemology. We have to deal with that. In other words, in some ways, <coughs> quote-unquote, reason. What is it? And are there irrational non-rational ways of knowing. The second issue is the issue of theodicy. This is a theological issue that, that is, is commonly invoked against religion. You know, how can God exist if all these terrible things keep happening? Every time something terrible happens, this issue comes up again and again and again. And cumulatively, it has an effect. And this is going to be a theological issue that Islam is going to have to weigh in, all right, and make its voice heard on, all right? The last issue is, and this is a, this is a controversial issue, but again, um, I'm simply here to enumerate the issues, not to say that I like them or not. That's beyond the point. But you see, in the modern state, the modern state, in a sense, emerges out of problems with religion. In that context, religion will be tolerated as long as it behaves. And if religion starts those problems all over again, then we'll find some way to deal with religion too, because we don't want to go back there. Now in that context, the whole issue of the fate 
of non-Muslims. Where do non-Muslims go when they die? The point here is that for many in the West, any religion that advocates that others go to hell, all right, is a social threat, is a threat to the social order. Everybody follow what I mean by that? Because it gives rise to these very deeply negative feelings that can unleash all kinds of negative uh, activities in society at large. All right? Now, I'm not of those who advocate that Islam change its position in the face of this challenge, but it will have to be very careful, very deliberate, and very wise in terms of how it articulates this in the West. Because if it is not, that will be, again, another cause for these attacks on religion as something that can bring nothing but divisiveness and, 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 and chaos and all these negative things to society. So this is among the major intellectual slash theological issues that I think we'll have to confront in the West. Okay, so I, I stopped with uh, those, those, what I see to be those three uh, burning uh, intellectual, intellectual challenges. Um, the next challenge I think that we have to confront in, 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 in the West, in, in, in America, um, more specifically, um, is the challenge of cultural production and the generation of cultural authority. And this, to me, implies that we come to an understanding of the limitations <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> Sorry. Uh, of the limitations of fiqh. Now, I don't want anybody to get alarmed here. I'm not talking about <coughs> any kind of secularism here. But what I mean in terms of the limitations of fiqh is this. Fiqh can tell me that this shirt is ubah, permissible. Um, maybe mustahab, I don't know. But certainly, at the very least, right? Um, it can tell me that if this shirt was silk, haram. Uh, it can give us ahkam. But it is not the role of fiqh nor the fuqaha to determine whether this shirt is chic. No, no, I'm not, I'm not joking here. I'm not joking here. Because the reality is that what Muslims, especially young Muslims, often labor under is living in a world that is defined by categories that carry the sensibilities of others. Where Muslims, don't inform the meaning of chic or stylish or elegant. <coughs> Muslims don't inform the meanings of any of these things. And therefore, those who want to be what? Chic or stylish or elegant are forced to do what? Partake of some other some other matrix. And this has a lot to do with the sense of cultural superiority, inferiority. Right? And it is to overburden fiqh 
to expect it to do this. It's not his job. It won't. And it's also a mistake to think that this is not important. Um, for, for so many of us, um, the, the problem is that we are comfortable under good circumstances uh, in two places, the home and the masjid. The space between these is often experienced as a threat. The space between them is informed by these moods, fads, vogues, categories that are constructed by others. And whether we like it or not, we subliminally consume them. Muslims have to understand that we too have to recognize the importance of cultural production and ideally of attaining cultural authority. And what do I mean by cultural authority? If uh, I took off this jacket and you looked inside and it said, <clears throat> Please, nobody be offended. No, no, never mind. Uh, no, no, no. no. Uh, uh, made in uh, Suriname. Right? But if it said, made in New York City, you go boss. No, no, you get the point that I'm making. Same jacket. Same jacket. One you say what? The other you say what? That's cultural authority. All right? It becomes a chic jacket because it was made in New York and has Hugo Boss written inside. No, no, this is very serious. This is very serious. Because the problem with cultural authority is that I may go just for the jacket, but all kinds of other things may come along with it. Especially if someone else is defining what chic and all these things are. This is what it means to live in the modern world. And I would argue that a huge part of the challenge facing Muslims, not only in the West, but in the world, is a cultural challenge. And that is where non-Muslim forces overrun us more than any place else. To the point that even when we end up in some kind of power, those sensibilities come along with us. And so, in the West, the absence of cultural authority and the ability to engage in cultural production preempts the ability to culturally appropriate. Because you need cultural authority to appropriate, to take from others, all right, without that implying dependency on others. Does anybody understand what I mean by that? All right? Um, um, Americans can borrow X from somebody. Hmm? Um, but that will not connote American dependency on that somebody because Americans have cultural authority to appropriate. You, you follow what I mean by that? All right? When the, when the lesser borrows from the, the greater, then that entails what? Huh? That, that entails dependency and it ends up enhancing the cultural authority huh, of the greater from whom it was borrowed. 
okay? And all of this is going on subliminally in our community. And we're trying to raise children as Muslims who are confident about themselves, all right? And what this can breed and has in some instances bred is what uh, the African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois calls double consciousness. Double consciousness Du Bois described it in the following terms. He said, back during the times where blacks were an oppressed, despised class in America, you take someone who's a black carpenter. Now on the one hand, he's a good carpenter. He loves his craft, and he excels at it. On the other hand, he's only a carpenter. From the perspective of the dominant group, a lowly carpenter. What this ends up doing is afflicting him with what Du Bois called double consciousness. He wants to be a carpenter because he loves carpentry. But he wants not to be a carpenter because it's a lowly, a lowly profession. And what we end up with, if we're not careful, and some of my Muslim youth, is this double consciousness. They want to be Muslims because they basically believe in Islam. And they've been raised to be Muslims. But there's a part of them that what? Was not to be Muslim because of the social stigma Hmm? the social and cultural dependency, and all the things that come along with that. And this becomes a major, major concern within Muslim communities. And here, what we really need is more explicit recognition of the need to unleash Muslim cultural imagination. And to recognize that you know, we're, we're fond, we Muslims, we're fond of saying that Islam is not just a religion. It's what? It's a whole way of life. If that is the case, then in addition to fuqaha, we need what? We need fashion designers, interior decorators, comedians, architects, all of the things that make up a full civilization. We need to recognize this much more explicitly. And in the challenge of civilizations, all of this is going to be necessary to be brought to the table. That's a reality that we're going to have to recognize. And to me, to me, a lot of this talk about ishtihad and maqasid al-sharia and all of this, in many instances, this is just so much barking up the wrong tree. I have nothing against ishtihad. I have nothing against maqasid al-sharia. Hmm? But to think that these issues are going to be resolved through that is simply a mistake. It's barking up the wrong tree. Now, I want us just to reflect for just a moment. When we think about, you know, we go to any Muslim country, and we what makes these Muslim countries? I'm not, I'm not talking about the people, but, but when I'm, look at the masjids. Look at the domes, the ornate, you know, the, 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 the niches. Look, you know, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, subhanAllah, wow. Hmm? Fukaha didn't do that. No, no, I'm very serious. Those circus tiles, Fukaha didn't do that. That calligraphy, Fukaha didn't do that. Hmm? And this is part of what made Islamic civilization attractive. Someone, uh, Mansoor, mentioned uh, Bernard Lewis. 
You know, Bernard Lewis, in one of his books, he talks about the situation in Spain where Christian priests were complaining that these Christian youth couldn't put together two paragraphs of correct Latin, and yet they can go on and on with this Arabic poetry. Why? Because Muslims had cultural authority. And there was a saying in Muslim Spain, Man aslama faqad tahaddar. Whoever becomes a Muslim hmm, has become civilized. <coughs> right? People became attracted to Islam. All right? On this basis. Culture, beauty, art. And let's have the fiqh debates. I know, you know, the music thing and all. Let's have the fiqh debates. And even there, recognize. Brothers and sisters, there are some issues that are simply mukhtalafiha, and they're always going to be mukhtalafiha. They're going to be debated, more than one opinion, and they're always going to be that way. All right? But we cannot ignore this issue of cultural authority. We cannot remain culturally dependent on others and expect to maintain our integrity, our confidence, our sense of an integrated self as Muslims, and pass this on to our children. And in this regard, one of the things we have to recognize is everyone has their role. It's not just the scholars. It's not just the shuyukh. It's not just the fuqaha. Everyone has their role. And this business of culture, it's a major, 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 major challenge for us. A major challenge for us. And I think that, you know, we need more explicitly uh, to recognize this, this fact um, because this is these are the kinds of things that operate on our psyche and our souls even in those moments of silence because they inform the atmosphere in which, in which we live. Our senses are taking it in almost 24-7, all right? This is one of the challenges that Islam and Muslims have to come to recognize and rise to in the modern world. That was 20 minutes already? All right. All right. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna all right. Um, so I got to give the abridged version. Um, a, a, another challenge that we face in, in 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 the West is the challenge of imams. Imams. And and and, and the challenge here, um, it's a challenge. I don't uh, imams uh, for for. I mean, some people may have complaints about imams, but you know. Um, imams are overworked, generally speaking. I don't know about here in Britain. I don't know. Maybe you guys treat your imams very, very well. I don't know. But generally speaking, uh, overworked, underpaid, uh, uh, not really uh, treated very well by boards. Uh, uh, so they have their challenges. Um, so I'm not, what I'm, what I'm going to say is not a, intended to be a critique of imams per se, but of the situation that has arisen around the office of imam and how the situation itself brings along with it certain problems and challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, one of the first of these is that imams, if they are um, qualified, or those who are most readily qualified to be imams, are those who have training in fiqh.
And that is a very laudable thing. It's a very understandable thing. All right? Um, but certainly in America, imams are routinely called upon not to function as jurists, not to give ahkam, but they're called upon to be pastors, marriage counselors, even therapists. I remember I was sitting in one of the imam's offices one day, and he just hit the button on the uh, uh, recorder, you know, the phone, uh, you know, the answer machine. He hit the button on the answering machine. My God. <laughs> My God. I mean, the things that were coming. We need really to think about this. We're overburning imams and in so doing, underserving communities. And we need to think about, you know, enhancing, you know, the imam's position either through more training, pastors, therapists, marriage counselors, whatever, or adding these kinds of professionals, you know, to that whole, to that whole staff. All right? These are serious, serious, serious issues. Because most of the imams that I know of, they're just learning on the job. And some of these issues are, are, are too, too complicated for them to deal with. Right? And sort of the culture that we've allowed to arise around this, all right, is what is he supposed to He can't turn them away. Because that's what people are expecting from him. And yet, he may not be in the best position to advise them. All right? So that's something major that, that, we, need, that we need to think about. Um, the, the, the other thing is um, sometimes people will come to the imam with a problem. Um, a drug problem, an alcohol problem, pornography problem. I hope I'm not being too adult here. No, I'm, I'm just. And the, and the question is not is this haram? He knows it's haram. He's seeking what? Some help. How can I overcome this? All right? We burden the imams with all of this. All right? We have to find a way out of this. And sometimes, even the suggestion of seeking professional help, I mean, that is not always as easy an option as we think because sometimes, you know, Professional help is not always infused with it doesn't know and it's not sensitive, you know, to our values as Muslims. All right? And so you can get sort of professional help that's not fully respectful uh, of your value system as a Muslim. And I'm not suggesting that there are professionals out there who mean to do anybody harm. I'm not suggesting that at all. They simply may not know, all right? And this raises a, a corollary to all of this. Again, everyone has their role. And part of what we need to do is we need to begin to develop professionals in this regard who are infused with our Islamic values and sensitivities who can actually advise, counsel, and aid our people in ways in which they need to be aided. This is a very, very serious issue, a very serious issue that, you know, especially in the West, um, we will have to uh, develop ways of dealing with. That was only 10, right? Good. Um, the second issue with regard to imams is, um, 
I'm trying to figure out how we're going to make this short, but let me put it this way. Um, sometimes, oftentimes, we confuse and conflate uh, jurisdiction of law with a jurisdiction of fact. Um, and this takes me back to a, to a very, very uh, old friend of mine, uh, Shihabuddin al Qarafi, uh, the great Maliki Usuli, um, who was very, very vigilant about this and very, very keen on reminding the fuqaha that you have to be mindful of this distinction. And the distinction is basically this. He says, if I want to know when it's incumbent upon me to offer the Zuhr prayer, I will go to Imam Malik and ask him because he has knowledge of the law based on his training, knowledge, and investigation of the sources. And on that basis, he can tell me when the sun passes at zenith, qayd al-ramh, you know, the length of, of a spear, then the time of dhuhr has come in. But that's a question of what? Of law. That's interpretation of the sources. Has the sun actually hit that point? That's a question of what? A fact. On that question, Manic might not have any more knowledge than me. In fact, if it's a tactical issue, I may have more knowledge than Manic, which is not at all to detract from his stature as a great mujtahid. But his ijtihad is in what? in nusus and in sources. He is not an investigator of fact. In fact, even the Prophet himself, alayhi salam, has statements that indicate something approaching this. And he tells the companions that some of you present cases to me in which one of you is more eloquent in presenting his case than the other. And I only judge on the basis of what I hear. But if one of you should receive a ruling from me on the basis of the facts that are presented, while he knows that the case is not actually that, then let him not take my ruling. For in that case, I will have but cut out for him a piece of the hellfire. Even the prophet is saying, what? You may know more about the facts than I do. So there's a distinction between facts and law. Now, what's the importance of this? Oftentimes, we overburden the imams by asking them to make all kinds of pronouncements on questions that are actually questions of fact rather than law. And this is a disservice to the imam, and it's also a disservice to the community. Because if he's not the most informed of the facts, then what he says is not likely to serve us in the best way. So for example, the imam can say, this is hypothetical, because I don't know the fiqhi sensibilities here in England, and. Uh, Despite what uh, Mizan says about explosive this and that, you know, I don't want to do that. But the imam might say, voting is halal. Hmm? That's a question of what? That's a question of law. You should vote for X. That's a question of what? It's a question of fact, depending on what. Well, what does X represent? 
What is his record? What does he represent? What is he likely to do? Of which I may have much more knowledge. In fact, I may need to appeal to you, all right, who spent a lifetime studying these kinds of things to inform us of the facts. All right? And then we factor the facts into our overall decision. All right? But this is an area in which, you know, the relationship between imams and communities, all right, needs to be brought into a better balance. Okay? Because without that, I mean, how can any imam know all the facts? They say you can't drink this tea because now you know what? Uh, so and so, they put pork in their tea. All right? Uh, imam says, okay, haram. What's wrong with that fatwa? What's wrong with that fatwa? Because they have the facts. You, PhD in chemistry? Here. Tell me what that has in it. Pork? Haram. No pork? Oh. Anybody follow what I mean by that? Right? We overburden imams. All right? And this is a, this is a, this is a disservice. It's a disservice to the community. Um, this also has a lot to do with, you know, recognizing the role of custom in Islamic law in that many of the entries in the books of fiqh are informed by the customs that prevail at the time that these entries were made. And when those customs change, the hukam must change as well. And we must be very assiduous in tracing changes in custom, which may be from place to place or time to time, all right? Before we simply run out with bland fatwas, all right, to be applied universally across the board. Because for people for whom that's not the custom, all right, that might actually be harmful to them. Uh, I'll give a, a concrete example. Um, and by the way, if we recognize this, we get out of this habit of saying Manic was wrong. No, Manic wasn't wrong. Manic was simply applying that to what? A different custom and a different practice. This is what Al Qarafi himself, by the way, he's a Maliki. He says, in the Muwatta, Manic says, if you say to your wife, anti khaliya, triple divorce. That's it. Qarafi says, wait a minute. There's still jurists now hmm, in 7th century Cairo who are running around telling people, if you say anti khaliya to your wife, you are divorced. Based on what? What Manik said in the Muwatta. Qarafi says, well, what Manik said in the Muwatta hmm, was based on the customary practice of that time. Hmm? And he goes through a whole explanation of how he arrived at, at that conclusion. And then he says, nobody uses that for this, this purpose today. The custom has changed. Was Manik wrong? No. Manik was right. I'm changing it. I'm also what? I'm also right. A new, a new custom. All right? This is part of the sensitivity with which we have to process our heritage. Otherwise, it becomes more of a burden on us all right, uh, than it was ever meant to be. And a lot of the sort of, I don't want to call it anti-clericism, but a lot of the negative animus, you know, towards <coughs> fiqh and these fuqaha and all this, a lot of it is just user error. It's not fiqh at all, it's user error, all right? And not understanding some of these some of these basic things. All right. Um, man, I'm never going to get through these. Well, th this this raises um, another issue, um, a related issue, and and that is the issue uh, of, of of literacy. 
And by literacy, I mean more broadly diffused Islamic literacy. And by Islamic literacy, I don't mean simply, you know, in America, we don't have what I understand is potentially the problem that you have here in England. We don't have a problem of overproduction of fuqaha. But what we have is a problem of a lack of literacy, Islamic literacy, among the masses. And when the masses um, are not literate, by which I mean they're not possessed of a functional literacy about what Sharia is, how it's constructed, basic things like the difference between law and fact, when they're not equipped with that, what you end up with potentially is the tail wagging the dog. Because no matter how enlightened the imam or the faqih may be, the people will not be ready to hear what they have to say. Because they are themselves not literate enough to appreciate the profundity or the correctness of what he's saying. All right? And so along with enhancements in you know, the position of the imam, we need to enhance the degree of Islamic literacy all right, that we as, as a community are, are, are possessed of. And I, I think that this is not something that's extremely difficult to do. But I think also we have to think about the, the wages that, that go along um, with this absence of literacy. You know, in the pre-modern world, literacy was one of the things or the absence of literacy, basic literacy, the, the ability to read and write, was one of the things that helped regulate the discipline of Islamic law and to keep quackery at bay. Why? Because such a limited segment of society was literate, all right? Then such a, li a limited segment of society could ever engage these sources and, and come up with things to say. In modern times, on the other hand, we have widely diffused literacy. Everybody can read and write. Massive proliferation of books. And now the internet. All right? But now just imagine this. You're a Muslim who's not been what he or she should be. And then you decide. I'm going to get serious about deen, right? And you start reading Quran, and you encounter this and that. <coughs> <coughs> and there are all these commands. Do, do, do. But you don't know. <coughs> A command <coughs> can imply obligation. It can imply recommendation. It can imply just simple licitness. <coughs> at least, <coughs> at least three possibilities. But you don't know that. So what you're going to take these to mean is what? Absolute obligation in every case. All right? And we just multiply that across our society. And then we imagine what this takes away from our ability to engage in civil discourse. Because the problem is, if I think that you're not serious about Islam, all right, that's not going to be a very civil discourse between us. Because you're just playing with the dean. All right? But if I understand that you follow what I'm saying? That No, no, no. You're just taking it to mean recommendation and not obligation. And that is a possibility. Then we can have a conversation. OK? This has far-reaching implications on our condition as a community. And here I might, I might say this. You know, 
we have many challenges coming at us as a Muslim community from, from without. We also have challenges, however, from within. And getting the love back into our community, getting the trust back into our community, the real, genuine brotherhood and sisterhood back into our community, these are major challenges that we face, especially as Muslims in the West. And no one is going to be able to do that but us. So these become very important issues. How much? OK. Um, the next issue is, um, I don't even know if I want to raise it because you know, when you raise these kinds of issues, you can rarely get out of them. Um, but it's, it's a major issue uh, for, for us in the West, certainly in America. And it's one of those what I would call um, a, uh, a frontier issue. <clears throat> It's a frontier issue uh, in as much as this is one of the first points of attack. Sometimes it's explicit, sometimes it's unspoken. But it's one of the first targets of attack. And that is the issue of Muslim women. Um, <clears throat> And I think this issue has to be seen in the context of the pervasive psychological power of the concept and the value of equality in the West. And there is increasingly no recognition of any functional differences between men and women, even between the male and female body. Increasingly. Now, as Muslims, we don't have a problem with inherent equality. I mean, a woman's prayer, woman's fasting, woman's charity is worth everything that a man's is worth. But we, there are functional distinctions between, between men and women. And in a real sense, Islam <coughs> has given men, um, in some ways, more responsibilities um, than, it has, than it has women. But I think that, <clears throat> look, the bottom line is that in the public domain, the biggest concern, I might want to call it negative concern, that Islam expresses is the, the wish to avoid illicit sexual interaction between the sexes. And Islam has set out to regulate that public space in such a manner that diminishes the occasions on which that might occur. And this is expressed in things like hijab and the uh, prohibition on khalwa and, and, things of, and things of that nature. Um, but we have to be careful that we don't overblow these considerations to the point that we burden Muslim women with a sense of stigma for simply being women. And again, we have to see this in a context of a broader society that is telling them precisely that. And I want to be very clear here part of my major concern is the psychological, the emotional, indeed the religious health of women, Muslim women. And I think that we should not overlook the importance and the significance 
of this reality. Um, in intellectual terms, these concerns have, of course, you know, led to um, any number of Muslim women um, identifying with feminism uh, as a means of trying to, in their words, or I shouldn't say in their words, um, perhaps in their minds trying to um, take back uh, the right to a dignified existence. Um, in the States, this has taken a couple of forms. Um, one, um, which is a more, you might want to say, radical form, is a form that says absolute equality or near absolute equality between men and women, that's the answer. And that means the abolishment or drastic reduction of any kind of gendered roles, period. And that is, from their perspective, the way to a dignified existence for women. This is out there. All right, um, and and to the extent that many Muslim women feel diminished, all right, many of them will gravitate towards this. There's another version, however, that says no. What we want is the rights and the considerations that Allah and His Messenger have given us, and we want men to live up to those rights. And we want communal orders that hold men responsible for those rights and obligations. And we don't want to abolish gendered roles because if we abolish gendered roles, that will also lead to almost punishing women because at the end of the day, women will end up with the children. And with no gendered roles, men are left sort of free of any assigned role to play. In America, this debate is, is unfolding. It's, 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 it's out there uh, now. And I think that um, one of the real, the real questions um, that comes out of this is whether Muslim communities in the West can sustain a dignified existence for Muslim women in ways that are entirely observant of the rules and values of Islam without this taking on a sense of capitulation. For many of us as Muslims, it's uncomfortable even to talk about this women issue because oftentimes it takes on the sense or the feeling that this is an issue that's largely being imposed upon us from without. This is not really our issue, all right? Um, but I would submit to you that it, that it is our issue. And it is an issue um, that, we have to, that we have to address. Um, and if we don't address these issues, then more um, responses um, will be coming from quarters that might not necessarily carry uh, the kinds of sensibilities that uh, we might wish them to carry. This is an issue uh, that, can't be, that can't be ignored. And I think in this context, I would say this. We are, you know, I, 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 I talked to, I had a conversation with a, I won't say any names, but I'll say this about them. And I hope there are not any, there are no hyper sensitivities in this room. But um, I had a conversation with a, a, a Salafi friend of mine back in the States. And uh, we were just agreeing that we need more Muslim women scholars, women who are grounded in the tradition of Islam, who can articulate the status 
the role, the value of women in Islam. Because you and I, we have no credibility in this regard. We need Muslim women who can do this. And you know, it's, it's, it's striking to me how we've, how we've arrived at some of the, some of the positions that we've arrived at as, as a community. You know, it's like, you know, very few uh, 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 scholars, particularly scholars of, of hadith that I can think of, uh, or scholars who studied hadith, they might not have been muhadithin, but they may have been fuqaha who studied hadith as, as, as a matter of course. Um, you'd be surprised that at the number of them who actually had female teachers. That's a, an aspect of our history that's sort of, sort of been forgotten. Um, but it's there. And, you know, why we've, and how we've arrived at the position that we've arrived at, I think, may call for some some, some serious investigation. But this issue uh, of women is one that's not going to go away. It's not one that's going to go away. And it's going to remain you know, a frontier issue for Muslims living in the West. Um, 20 more minutes? Yes, I can see you. I'm joking. Um, all right, I'm going to be very quick here. Um, three or four more issues, and I'll be very quick. Um, I don't know what the situation is in, in, in Britain, but we have some issues with our mosques. Um, to put it just bluntly and um, succinctly, um, most Muslims are unmasked. They don't come to the masjid. Um, and this is because for, for many of them, Masjids are scary places. Um, now, I don't, I don't, I want to be fair. I mean, because the problem could reside in these people as, as much as it resides in the masjid. I, I don't want to uh, sort of very, in a cavalier fashion, just, just assign uh, uh, blame like that. But I, I, I do think that it's uh, a little irresponsible for us to completely ignore the fact that um, most Muslims are unmasked. And I think that two things are perhaps worthy of consideration here. And I really mean worthy of consideration. I'm not <coughs> pushing any sort of uh, agenda here. Um, one is to ask what effect the ideological ownership of mosques has on mosque attendance. Does everybody understand what I mean by ideological? I mean, this is a Sufi mosque, this is a Diobandi mosque, this is a Salafi mosque, this is a, what, 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 what effect that has on masjid attendance. And then secondly, um, whether we are in some instances overloading our masjids with, with activities that perhaps we may want to think about finding third spaces for. I mean, even activities like, like this. If some people think that my presentation here is just ultra liberal or just ultra conservative or, or just crazy or something like that, I mean, that can end up associated with the masjid, and they can develop you know, a certain predisposition towards the masjid based on that. Perhaps some other third space is the location for these kinds of activities, and the masjid can maintain its primary function you know, as a sanctuary and a place for glorifying God, all right? Where, where, where people come you know, to unload their worries to unload their ambitions, their aspirations before their Lord and can do so in peace, you know, in, in a sense of, 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 of tranquility. I think that, you know, coming to the West, we, we tended, you know, once we, I'm talking about America now, you know, once we, you know, started establishing Muslim communities, you know, to, 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 to sort of, 
to attach all of our aspirations in terms of activities to the masjid. Um, and while that's understandable, um, from one perspective, um, I, I, I suspect in some ways that we might now have reached the point of diminishing return. Uh, and uh, we might want to think about um, whether it's time to um, move back in the direction of, of shrinking the activities of the masjid um, in such a way that, that the, the main function, that is as a sanctuary, um, is not forfeited to any of these other, these other kinds of activities. Um, uh, three more real quick. Um, unity. I already talked about that before, but this is a major issue, and I know it, you know, it, you know we repeat it so often that, you know, it, it, it often sometimes um, sounds, sounds, sounds corny, um, but it's, it's a real, it's, it's a real serious issue. Um, a friend of mine is fond of saying that he has never seen Islam walk down the street. And by that he means that Islam, as represented in the world at any given time, is the Muslims. Islam, as represented in the world at any given time, is the Muslims. And we are either divided or united. We either love each other or we don't. Respect each other or we don't. And that has an enormous impact on the quality of life as Muslims that we enjoy. The quality of life as Muslims that we enjoy. You know, it's always impressed me that, that, that the Prophet did not primarily, alayhi salam, refer to those who followed him as his followers, but rather as what? His ashab. <coughs> ashab. These are people, I love them, they love me. All right, these are my friends. These, 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 these are people who are meaningful in my life. I care about them, and they know I care about them. They care about me, and I know they care about me. There's this bond between them, all right? I mean, we have to, to recognize the importance of this. And I don't know what the situation in Britain is, oh, I'm sorry, UK is. I don't know what the situation in the UK is. But in America, this is an enormously huge challenge. Because in America, we have something like 60-something-odd ethnicities making up the Muslim community. And we're trying to forge a sense of community out of all of this. Um, and this is in the context of the fact that, as I said earlier, you know, we're trying to change, modify, we have to rectify the mood about Islam in America. And again, that takes numbers. And we should not mistake unity for uniformity. And I think that um, one thing I will say here is, you know, we, we've got to arrive at a fair, grounded, authentic criterion for this business of takfir. And outside of that, we have to recognize each other as brothers and sisters and work with that. This is going to be part of our future in the West. Um, two more and then I'll stop. Well, three more, if I can. All right, very, very quickly. Uh, another challenge that we have uh, in, 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 in America is coalition building. Um, who are our allies? 
uh, and of course, this is a this is a very complicated complicated issue. Um, one of the things that complicates this is the whole question of whether we are in a position, in a sense, um, to pay the price for having allies. And part of the price is this: um, allies are going to say, "All right, we'll support you on this issue." Um, then we do we then turn around and say, "Well." We can only support you on Islamic issues. Um, we have to, as a community, um, arrive at ways of being able to negotiate this successfully. Um, and um, here, I think one of the things that we might benefit from um, is something that I have personally um, recognized as, as having always existed in Islam, and that is a distinction between moral judgments on the one hand and political arrangements on the other. That is to say that Islam going all the way back to the time of the Prophet in allowing Jews or Christians to live and worship in society was not to say that we what? We agree with Jews and Christians religiously. Right? And therefore it's not necessary that every time we support someone politically that we necessarily agree with them religiously or morally. All right? Now, that will not do all of our work for us, but I think that that may be a point of departure in terms of trying to develop a grounded, authentic premise or foundation for how we can negotiate this business of negotiation, uh, of uh, uh, this business of, uh, of, of coalition building. Um, and we, 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 we do need coalitions. And this is something that goes back to the time of the Prophet himself, alayhi salam. The Prophet himself had uh, allies, uh, some of whom were not Muslims. Um, and this is something that uh, we need to recognize. But again, you know, um, we, we want to do this not simply as pragmatics um, because we're scared or because we're desperate, all right? We want to do these things because we have succeeded in grounding them in authentic interpretations of Islam, all right? And the last thing I'll say about these coalitions is that we need coalitions not only to defend the interests of Muslims, hmm, but to tame the modern state. The modern state is just, is just a monster. It's a leviathan. And it's taking more and more and more and more power to intrude in more and more aspects of our lives every day. And we need to have functional counterpoises to that tendency in order to try to tame that modern state. I, I, I want to finish um, by mentioning something about um, um, the, 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 the challenge of, of, of Sharia. Uh, um, I don't know about here in England, but now um, in, 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 in America, uh, the anti-Islamic forces have been successful in really doing a lot of damage uh, to the very word and concept of, 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 of Sharia. And um, I think that we uh, have responsibility not to aid them um, in this attempt on, 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 on their part. Um, I think that a large part of this um, is 
that Sharia is seen now as an instrument of a sort of George Orwellian um, totalitarian <coughs> system of control. Um, Muslims are, are angry at modernity. They're angry at the societies that modernity has produced. These societies deserve to be punished for what they have come to constitute. Um, and the sense is that many Muslims see Sharia as the instrument through which society can be punished. I'm not saying that that's the reality, but that's the image. That Sharia is now an instrument of punishment. is <laughs> an instrument to which Muslims carry out their, their issues uh, with modern society. I want to warn us against um, perhaps um, unwittingly lapsing into uh, sort of a form of, of, of or mentality even, of, of, of secularism. Um, if I sit in my house uh, and drink wine every morning, brush my teeth, wash out my mouth, come outside, what punishments does Islam authorize for me? Right? If I have 14 girlfriends, nobody ever sees me. In fact, you see me directly, but nobody else does. What punishments does Islam authorize for me here? You seem a little hesitant. None. Islam's genius, in a sense. And you know, I, I, have, to, I have to say this, this is really profound. It was, it was a Jewish colleague of mine many years ago who said, you know, you know, Islam may be the first religion in the history of mankind that got a society to voluntarily give up alcohol. Islam's genius has been that its means of bringing human beings out of these kinds of behaviors has been primarily through the inculcation of taqwa, God consciousness, and fear of God. And it's those people who act in such a way that threaten the social fabric. Those are the people whom are punished here and now. Secularists don't believe in any world beyond now. So I might sit in my house, and drink my wine, and wash out my mouth, and you can't do anything about it here. But Allah can do something about it there. That is Islam. Secularists don't believe in any what? There. They don't believe in any world beyond this one. As a result of which, all punishment has to be meted out here. We have to be careful about unwittingly falling into a secularist mentality. All right? And understand that our real role as Muslims is to try to inculcate, inculcate taqwa in God consciousness. And that is also a part of Sharia. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen was salatu was salamu ala Rasuli Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabi ma'in amma ba'd. فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وقال تعالى ولو شاء الله لن تصر منهم ولكن ليبلو بعضكم ببعض My dear brothers and sisters uh, In شاء الله I'm going to talk about this topic that how as a minority we are going to live 
uh, in, in the West as the Muslims and what are our uh, responsibilities, uh, especially in the light of the experience of, uh, of India, Muslims in India, you know, which is a long history of Muslims in India. But before that, actually, I would like to, you know, mention one important thing. You know, you people, mashallah, and young people, the thing basically is, you know, when we mention the history of, uh, of those people, it is not that, you know, we get up from here either praising those people or criticizing them. You know, the thing is that we get inspiration from those people and work like that, you know, work hard like that. Between young people, they should be working hard. You know, the, our aspiration should be that we have to bring a change, something for our, our society. We have to do for our future, of our children, our generation. So that actually, that, that main message should be there, that we are going to make a change, we are going to make a contribution. We are going to learn from those people and then move forward, inshallah. You know, our aspiration should not be like many, many young people actually can see the, in society where we live around that you know, many young people actually at the end of the day, what we think really that we get degrees and then after that we get a job and we get married and enjoy the life. This should not be actually, you know, what, how a Muslim think. You know, like for example, you know, one of the <coughs> Abbasid poet Abu Nawas, he used to summarize the, you know, aspiration of the young people, you know, from his time, you know, in one of his poetic verses very nicely. إِنَّمَا الدُّنْيَا تَعَامٌ وَشَرَابٌ وَمُدَامٌ فَإِذَا فَاتَكَ هَذَا فَعَلَى الدُّنْيَا سَلَامٌ You know, dunya, what is dunya? The world is basically just eating and drinking and enjoying the wine. If you miss this, then there should be salam and goodbye to dunya. So, you know, there can be some people like that really, that dunya basically eating and drinking and enjoying the wine. And if you don't have that, then say salam to this dunya. But you know, young people, young Muslims, they should not have this ambition. This, you know, there should be something more different. different. But the problem actually is when you look around really, many, many young Muslims really, their, their aspirations actually are like that. Good house, good family life, you know, marriage and things like that. They don't want to have any difficulty, any problem, any trouble in the life. They want a peaceful life, a life of easiness, a life of comfort. Com comfort. That actually many people think. This is not the way of the believer. Believers are not here to enjoy the life. They basically here are to sacrifice the life. They are to, you know, to do hard, hard works for the life. <coughs> You know, Iqbal, you know, he said very nicely, you know, crying on, on the young people of his time. And he said in one of the uh, Urdu poetry, Tera sofe hai afrangi, Tera sofe hai afrangi, Tere kaali hai irani, Lahu mushko rulati hai, Javano ki tan asani. Your sofas are from Europe. You know, your tera sofa hai, So the sofe hai afrangi. Your sofas are from, from France or from, you know, from, from Europe. And your carpets are from Persia. You know, I, I, I cry with the blood in my eyes when I look at the easy life of, of young people. You know, this actually is what is happening for many people. You know, this is not the aspiration of young Muslims, men and women. You know, we, have, we are here to sacrifice, not to enjoy the life. The thing basically in the life is that you have to sacrifice all enjoyment and things should be different really. Take lessons from one of the Persian story. And that actually very important story and especially in Urdu and Persian, all the time, you know, great poets always have been using that story. I'm going to start with that story because that actually tells the summarize the whole thing about actually what Islam wants for the believers. And actually that is the, you know, the struggle and the jihad and the hard work that you can see in the Quran and uh, in the biography of the, of the companies of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The story basically very simple. The story is these two young men, young, young, young people, Farhad and Shiri. Shiri is young girl. She is beautiful, she is attractive, and Farhad is a young boy, young man, and he has fallen in the love of Shirin. So Farhad is a lover, and Shirin is beloved. The story between these two people. Farhad wants to marry her. Farhad wants to get, get Shirin. Shirin puts a condition. Her condition is, you only can get me, or you only can marry me, if you look at this mountain, around, uh, you know, in front of my house, dig the mountain, and then make a uh, you know, uh, canal, uh, of, of milk flow from the mountain. The condition is dig the mountain and make, you know, canal of, full of milk flow from that. You know, what happened to you? Did Farhad ask her, you know, this is a very difficult condition? Did he say, if I do this, uh, you know, I will die and I never can get you? No, this is a thing really. She said, then he said, easy. If that what she wants and I want to get her, whatever she wants that I have to do. No question, nothing. What he did, then he started digging the in a mountain. He died while digging the mountain. He didn't get her. <laughs> but the thing is that, you know, he died why, for what? He died to get her. That actually, that is the main thing really. What we people want really to get Shiri, 
without digging the mountain. <laughs> so you cannot get that. You cannot get Shiri without digging the mountain. Now, for example, sometimes we think somebody else digs the mountain and then we get Shiri. <laughs> but you know, that will never happen. Shiri is not going to love you if somebody else digs the mountain. She will marry that person. Why you? Just think really. So this is actually very important to understand this thing. If you want Shiri, the way in the life is that dig the mountain and make the effort. Even if you don't get her, at least she will like you. That in the, her path, yeah, she will love you. Like, you know, the story is, uh, in Persian is uh, that uh, when Yusuf Ali Salam was sold in the market of Egypt, you know, the stories people have been developing, making many, many details, uh, which are not in the Quran. But the story is actually very nice. And Yusuf Zulaikha is uh, a book written by Mawana Abdul Rahman Jami, great Sufi Naqshbandi, Shaykh uh, of the 10th century of Hijra. So he has written, uh, you know, many details which are not in the Quran. One of the details is when the Zulaikha was so, uh, Yusuf was sold in the market of Egypt, everybody is coming, coming to buy uh, Yusuf, whatever they have got. An old woman, she didn't have anything in the house other than some cotton. So she brought the cotton to buy him. There are people, the kings and amirs and nobles, they are buying Yusuf, and she just brought some cotton uh, to buy Yusuf. So people ask this old woman, you know, you, are, you can't buy Yusuf, you know, buy, buy, buy this, this cotton. So she said, even if I cannot buy him, at least my name will be registered among those who came to buy him. You see, they are thing. It, you know, if you cannot dig the mountain, at least you know, your name should be like that. This actually is a thing. That why, you know, one of the poets said in Persian language very nicely, manzil laila ki bajan shart awwal qadam anast ki In the path of, in the path of the manzil of laila, in the path of the way of the laila, though there are so many dangers and so many problems for the life, the first condition of that path is you become majnu. If you want to get laila, the first condition is to be Majnu. And what Majnu means? Understand this thing really. What Majnu? Majnu actually, you know, his name is Qais, but he became mad in the love of Layla, so people call him Majnu. Both are from Banu Tamim, from the same tribe, maybe with their cousins. And, you know, Qais, he forced in the love of Majnu, in, la in the love of Layla. And, uh, you know, he became mad. But, you know, somehow, there never have been marriage between, between both of them. And Qais actually always have been lover, and, you know, he became mad in the love, and Layla knew that. So whenever Qais used to pa pass by the street of Layla, Layla used to send a, a bowl full of, full of milk for Majnu because she knew that he, you know, he loves her. So she used to send a, uh, milk, a full of, you know, bowl of milk to, to Majnu. When other pe young people saw you know, to become Majnu, to love Layla means to have you know, milk and you know, bowl of milk. Everybody became, all young people in, in the street, they became Majnu. And then one day, the slave girl, she brought you know, full, you know, a bowl full of milk and then she saw there not only one Majnu, there are so many Majnu. So she didn't know what to do. She came inside the house and said to said Laila, you know, there are so many Majnu, who should give? So she said, okay, you know, empty the bowl and take the empty bowl and ask, you know, today Laila has changed her mind. She is asking you your blood. Then all the fake Majnu, they disappeared. The real Majnu, he remained there. And he said, go and ask Layla from which part of my body she wants the, you know, the, the blood. And then she came and told Layla, Layla said, he is the real Majnu. So, you know, if you want really a bowl full of milk, the thing is, get ready to offer, you know, a bowl full, full of your blood. You know, when people can do that really, then they can get, 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 get Layla. This is the thing really. If you want to have Shiri, the condition is, get ready to dig the mountain. Don't ask questions. People tell people, that, you know, the Prophet used to do miswak, his sunnah. Then there were hundreds of questions before uh, doing the miswak. They will say, why miswak? What are the benefits for that? It's scientifically approved and things going, going like that. You know, if you love the Prophet if you love paradise, if you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then get ready for everything that, that they, he asks. Inna Allah hashtara min al-mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al-jannah. Allah has bought from the believers their lives and their property. For what purpose? You know, for one thing. The degree of paradise, you know, get, get ready for that. Don't ask all time questions, how and why. The thing is, you know, be in true love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his, his messenger. So if you look actually in the history of the people, not only in India, everywhere actually you can see those people who actually came out to reform Muslim society, they are the people who have been working hard, believed in what they have been doing. They are not just talking, they are working, they are people in action. You know, any people can do. And it's, you know, I'm just going to tell you the history of actually and wh how the reformers in India, they basically, they started their work during the British rule. And especially, uh, you know, after 1857, when, you know, last uh, Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah Dafar, he was basically, you know, 
you know, uh, 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 sent actually from there to Burma in a long history and a lot of bloodshed in India. And after 15, 1857, really, Muslims actually realized that they don't have a future, you know, of uh, that, that past, that past is gone. Now they are, you know, they are basically ruled by, by, by other people. They realized that, then they started to do something to new, how to, how, to, how to reform the society and how to bring, you know, faith and amal and action among their people. So there have been one experience of the establishing the madrasat, you know, schools, schools of knowledge. You know, Deoband was established there and Nadastro Alama was established many, many madrasat. People thought really, if we cannot, you know, rule India, at least we have to preserve our culture, our religion, and at least we pass on the heritage to our new, next generation. That was not easy, because when you study in these madrasas and in these schools, you cannot get a job. There was no job for that. Basically, getting admission in the madrasa meant that you are going to sacrifice your future. You don't have income, your income will be limited, you will be in a lot of problem. But these people really, they did work hard. If you look in the history of Deoban, what happened, the people established the Deoban, they did not actually have build a building first, no. First thing they did really, they started teaching underneath of a tree. Deoban started from underneath a tree. Now there are so many people in the world, they claim to be in love of Deoban, but they start with the palace. They start with the big building. First thing they do, build a building. People who build the Deoban, they start underneath a tree. And they look actually in their life, really how they have been, you know, waking up in the night, prayer in the night, and during the daytime teaching, full sacrifice. One, on the one hand, ibadah, piety, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the other hand, you know, full actually, you know, rigorous education and study, that what they have done. Similarly, actually, you come to Nazrat ulama, people who actually have been behind Nazrat ulama, if you look in the history, you know, piety and zuhd, and very much away from dunya. You know, Shaykh Abbas Nadir, rahmullah ta'ala, actually is mentioned many, many times in in his majlis, actually, I heard from him many times. He said there have been time in other ulama that we teachers did not have salary for many, many months. No salary, nothing to pay. And then we used to go and you know raise actually money from the shops in Lucknow to so teachers could be paid. And sometimes very, very little payment. That how they actually built these madrasas and this institution. When you look actually, you know what they are now in the present. Look at their past, how they have been. So one way, one thing actually, that many, many ulama did. They started establishing madrasas and centers of education learning in India. And that's actually one thing we can actually follow them, that we want to educate our, 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 our next generation in a properly Islamic way. And the way basically to teach them Arabic language, teach them the sources, the Quran and the Sunnah and the Fiqh, and produce among them Mufti and Fuqaha and Muhaddithin, and also reformers and Du'at and people who can, who can defend Islam. And you can see really these people, they actually, you know, they, they were in every field. They are best teaching. They are du'at, they are preachers, and they are writers, they are defenders of Islam. They have been defending Islam against Orientalists. They have been defending Islam against Hindu preachers and against uh, uh, Christian missionaries. They have been working hard in every field. No, they are not just sitting there, they are working hard. And then, in the beginning of the 20th century, when basically you can see the, you know, the, the news, the side news actually arrived to India in 1924. Then when, you know, by Kamala the Turk, you know, Khilafa was basically abolished. And it was a big, th big thing for Indian people. If you know the history of India, that was a very strong Khilafa movement. And people, if you, the historians say, India never has been so much united as actually for the movement of the Khilafa. The whole India, Muslims and Hindu, everybody basically behind the leaders of the movement of Khilafa, from, from the south to the north, from the east to the west. That was the biggest movement in India for the Khilafa. And when it was abolished, it was basically very, very sad for, for, for Indian Muslims. One thing actually some people did, and among them actually no doubt, Mawlai Yas Rahmullah Ta'ala, he realized actually the time has come that you know, we have to realize actually we have to create among Muslims the confidence. And we have to create among them really the you know, basic Iman, basic belief in, in, in their sources and also in Allah and His Messenger and last day. And they should not actually have this grief and this sadness so much that can affect their life. So he actually started working on that thing in that mosque of Delhi, small mosque of Delhi. But you know, if you look at his life, how he was, nothing to eat, nothing much to eat very often. He and his family very often, they used to basically survive on certain fruits which are coming on the, on the wild trees. Nothing there, nothing much. And whatever money he used to have, sometimes he said that he used to see the, you know, the Muslim laborers, they're waiting for, you know, for someone to who can employ them you know, in daily for construction work. He used to go to those Muslim neighbors and ask them, how much you are paid daily? And they will say, we are paid this money, this money. He will ask them, come to me, I will pay the same amount. He would invite them and teach them Islam, teach them the Quran, 
teach them the sunnah and at the end of the day he would pay them what they would have received from anywhere else. Just think really. Just this thinking that how he can bring Islam to the, to the people. These, these, you know, he's paying from his own pocket. There's no money. And for his own family, just they say sometimes they don't have anything to eat. Just hunger. That's how he did really. Mawlana Yas rahmanullah ta'ala. And it was no doubt really one of the most successful uh, movement in, in, in modern time. And you can see really not even India, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Europe, America, everywhere. There are problems, no doubt. There are mistakes have been done by certain people. But you know how the hard work has been done uh, by, by, by these people. And actually among the great people of India, they basically supported that movement. Among them was, uh, you know, even actually Mawla Abul Ala Madhudi Rahmullah Ta'ala. He also spent some time with Mawla Elias Rahmullah Ta'ala in Miwat. Similarly, Sheikh Mullah Sanadhi Rahmullah Ta'ala. And many, many great people of India, they supported him and they participated in that, that movement. But at the same time, you know, some Mawla Abul Ala Madhudi, you know, and also some people, he was, he was actually inspired by another very intelligent person. In India at that time, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, many people don't know him really, but uh, if you look in the history of India in the, at the end of the uh, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, he was really a you know, very, very important person. And uh, he really inspired the whole India. And he, when he used to write on his, uh, his, news, uh, his, his paper in Al Hilal, uh, and he used to come in, uh, every fortnightly. And people used to basically like break the shop actually, you know, to, to get the newspaper. And even the shuyukh in Deoban, they actually were keen how, how to read it. Very, very, you know, good message, strong message. And writing was so powerful <coughs> that people really basically mad for that. So he inspired many, many people, no doubt really. He was big, good, you know, big inspiration for many, many people. And one of the young men actually who inspired by him is Maulana Abul Ala Madhuzi Rahmullah Ta'ala. No doubt he was himself, uh, you know, genius and, uh, and very intelligent. He actually spent some time with Mawlana Yas Rahmullah Ta'ala and he looked at India at that time. He realized that, you know, there are something more needed. No doubt what Mawlana Yas Rahmullah is doing is very important work. But in India, really, we need this confidence among young, young people that Islam can provide, you know, uh, what, you know that good system uh, of, the, uh, of governing that they can see uh, from, from, from Britain from, uh, or from, from the West. And then he actually started, you know, you know repeating again and again uh, this whole thing that Islam is a comprehensive religion. So this thing really very powerfully was first time said in India by him. Though actually there was something like that in the writings of uh, Mawla Bukram Azad and many others, but Mawla Maududi is the first person really who emphasized on this thing again and again that Islam is a comprehensive religion. And the, for that purpose, he had many, many writings. And his writings really are no doubt really so powerful that the people actually, the, his, the people who have written the writings, the history of uh, Indian literature, they say for everybody else, you can say what are their best writing, what, are, what are better they, they produce. You know, for, for Abu Hassan Nadvi and for Shibri Nu'mani, or for many other people, you can say what are the best books really. But for Mawla Maududi, it is very difficult to find out what is his best writing. Every book actually he wrote actually with proper effort and full, full, full labor. And you know, his book Al-Jihad of Islam and then Parda, you know, the uh, veil about uh, the women. And any, uh, all those writers, his tafsir. They're really, you know, amazing, really. And he did, you know, no doubt, really, very important work in this matter. And that's why he really appealed, you know, all, you know, and he brought together all those good thinkers and, and Muslim scholars at that time. And in Maghdibhad, Sheikh Abdul Sanadi, rahmullah ta'ala, from Nazir Ulama, Mawlana Muhammad Manzul Numani from Deoband, and also Mawlana Amin Hassan Islahi from Masjid Islah, who was a student of Mawlana Farahi. All these big people, they around him. And no doubt, really, they're working hard. And these people really they establish uh, Jamaat Islami, and that is the time in uh, in, in Egypt and Middle East uh, when Muslim Brotherhood of the Muslim they are rising under leadership of Salman Shahidullah Taala, and later on under the writings of uh, Sayyid Qutb Shahid and many others, and very similar to especially Sayyid Qutb Shahid, he was very much influenced uh, by writings of Mawlana Abu, Abu Ala Maududi. You can find the similarity, and very after course he may uh, anyways Mawlana Abu Ala Maududi, no doubt he made great impact. On, on, the, on the writers of his time, you know, in the Middle East and also in India. So this actually thing was coming, but what people realized actually very quickly that what is happening is that very, you know, Islam basically now has got a new language and it has become like a political movement. So some people realize actually that, you know, Mawlana Madhudi started, you know, with this thing that Islam is a comprehensive religion, but because the thing is the state and all those things that have been brought and right, you know, and he's emphasizing on those so much that young people, they basically are thinking that Islam is like a political movement. 
and that actually also you can find from the writings such as Shahid that Islam is very often interpreted as being a political uh, uh, movement. This actually made some of the people who actually joined Maulana Maududi in the beginning uh, worried, especially Maulana Abu Hassan Nadwi and, uh, 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 and also Maulana Manzul Numani. And these people, after a while, when they realized actually there's no way that you can convince Maulana Maududi, they left him. And they, then they got actually a new idea. That new idea in India was basically was very important really. Uh, because they realized actually what happening is when you make Islam a political movement, what you are doing actually is you are dividing Muslim society into two parts. There are Muslims who are supporting you or there are Muslims who are opposing you. And this is very dangerous for any Muslim society. Same, you know, at that time, Mawana Abu Hassan Nadwi, he saw actually in Egypt what happening is there are Muslims supporting Hassan Manna Shahid and a Muslim Brotherhood and there are Muslims who they are also sincere, but they are opposed, they, they are opposing that. The Muslim, Muslim nations everywhere, they are divided because of these things. There should be a way where you can unite them. And also the thing is, when you make Islam a political movement, what happening actually, the people who are ruling, they don't want to, you know, they don't want you to get the power. You know, they want to win the power. Uh, like uh, Abu Hassan Nadri very, very often used to say that he attended one of the conference of Muslim rulers uh, and there was Hafiz al-Assad, the father of Bashar al-Assad. The Mawla uh, Abu Hassan Nadri said uh, when he gave the speech, uh, he said in the speech, uh, I can break the chair, but I cannot leave it. Uh, that's what his son is doing anyway. So, you know, he said, I can break the chair, but I cannot leave it. So, you know, Mawla actually realized uh, that this actually is a big problem, you know. Because when you make Islam political movement, you can see the rulers, they will not support you, they will not let you, and they will make every effort to defeat you and to basically persecute or do whatever. And that happened in Egypt. You know, all these people of Muslim Brotherhood during the time of Jamal Abdul Nasir, and then later on, they are in the prison, and the punishment they have got in the prison really is something people have to cry. I was reading actually one of the account of, uh, you know, uh, some of these people, and they say in the prison, when they become, they used to feel thirsty, they were forced to drink their own urine their own urine. And the writer said, is it easy to drink the urine? You know, that's how, how punishment actually used to happen in the prison of, uh, of Egypt. The very, very, you know, it basically it is really very painful to read the whole thing. That's why Mawla was son theoretically, this is one way that you make effort to bring, uh, you know, uh, Muslims to the power. Then other way, and then another way actually was, you know, his, you know he was inspired by, you know, by another reform in India, and that a great man of India, no doubt, Sheikh uh, Ahmad al-Sarhindi, <coughs> Ahmad ibn Abdul Ahid Ahad al-Sarhindi, and who is called in India, Mujaddid al-Fathani. He died uh, in 1034 of Hijra. Uh, that basically Christian era 1624, 1624. In India, uh, you know, there have been so many Muslim dynasties coming from, from, from uh, Central Asia, or uh, from, from Turkey, uh, or from uh, Imam Afghans. The last major Muslim dynasty which established its rule in India, that actually is a Mughal dynasty. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, the one who established the, the rule there is Babar. And Babar was a reasonable person. And then uh, his son Humayun, he succeeded him. And later on, actually, Humayun was defeated by another uh, ruler, Shah Shah Suri. And then Humayun remained, Humayun remained in exile for <coughs> 15 years. And during these 15 years, Shah Shah Suri and then his descendants, they have been ruling India. Then after 15 years, Humayun come back again, and then he took, take, takes over uh, India uh, daily, and, uh, and, and there is around that, uh, and after one year, he dies. And he had a son, Akbar, who was not educated, not learned. He succeeded him. But Akbar has got in his ministry very learned people. And Akbar started that with his life very as a pious person. But these people who actually intelligent people who were in his court, like Abu Fadl and Faid, they are amazing people. Really. If you read, read their, their writings, they are amazing, really. They are the most actually genius people you can see uh, from their time. And that's actually, I mean, all these people, they made a conspiracy that, you know, how to change the mind of, uh, of Akbar. And one thing they start actually is that they said, they convinced him that now 1,000 years has passed on Islam. And now we are entering into new millennium. And, you know, there was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 1,000 years, for the new millennium, we need a new prophet. So basically, they convinced him, and Akbar, you know, he didn't know much actually after a while, he was convinced. So they made a new religion, Deen Elahi, and that actually some people, you know, even used to mock. Uh, one of the writer, you know, of that time, Mullah Shiri, he says very nicely in one of his writings, Badshah imsal da'awaya nubuwat karda ast, agar khuda khahad, pasas saale khuda khaha shudan. He writes that this year, the king has claimed that he's a prophet. If God wills, next year he will claim that he is God. 
So you can see really that what happening is, uh, and uh, not only that, what? Yeah? Fifteen more minutes. About fifteen minutes. Okay. So this uh, Akbar's fitna actually it was very very you know it was actually most severe fitna for in Indian Muslims. You know Muslims never had any fitna like that. Yeah, he, uh, you know he's, it becomes so uh, uh, that you know, he he hated the name Muhammad. The anybody who got you know he did not like name Muhammad. He he did not like Arabic language. And uh, many shagair, many symbols of Islam, they were basically mocked. Uh, it was a big problem for, for, uh, uh, for Muslims in India. And it was not easy because he had you know, power. And you know, very power. the Mughal army was very, very powerful. And they're just young, you know, the, uh, the Mughal empire was on its youth and the great Mughals. So there's nowhere really to defeat them. All these ulama, they are crying. And they're really, if you read the writing, they are, you know, they're basically, there's such a pain that what happening is that now India is ruled by this man. Who basically is you know, hating Islam. But you know, my Shaykh Ahmad Sarahani Rahmullah, whose name I mentioned, he had the wisdom. He realized this is not the time to make another army, to fight the king. This is not the time. What <coughs> he did really, he started writing letters to the, to the, to the ministers and the court people of, of Jahangir. Akbar died, and then his son Jahangir became his successor. So by that time, all these bidahs and all these problems have very, you know, have become very much deep in India. He realized that this is not the time to fight the way basically that I change the people around, around Jahangir, around the court. Once they are changed, then the king will be changed. And he really did very nice and very effectively, very powerful letters. If you read the, those letters, you know, actually could quote something, but uh, we don't have enough time. The very powerful letters. And he changed the minds of the ministers. He changed the minds of the people in the court until actually Jahangir himself was changed. And then uh, it, the change act also uh, was in, had impact on his son Shah Jahan. And Shah Jahan was far, far better than his father Jahangir in you know, the fight in, 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 in Islam. And then after Shah Jahan comes his son Aurangzeb Rahmullah Ta'ala, Alam, Alamgir Aurangzeb Rahmullah Ta'ala. And no doubt really India never had any, any king or any sultan as pious as Aurangzeb Rahmullah Ta'ala. Actually, some people say, like, you know, Sheikh Ali Tabi Rahmullah Ta'ala. Uh, you know, from Syria, who later on settled in, in Makkah al Mukarrama, he used to say about Aurangzeb Rahmullah Ta'ala, Saad Sul Khulafai Rashidin. The four Khulafai Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the fifth one, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, and the sixth one, Aurangzeb Rahmullah Ta'ala. Just seriously, what Ahmad Salindi has done, just writing letters, you know, he did not like to take over the government. Just he wanted to make, you know, ch changes. And the changes actually resulted in Aurangzeb being on the throne of Delhi and Agra. And that man, you know, even when he became 80 year old, if you read the history of Aurangzeb Rahmullah Ta'ala, nights in the prayer, nights in the prayer are during the daytime on the back of the horses fighting. Even when he was 80 year old in the jihad. Just imagine that man. In the night, most of the time he's spending in the prayer. And actually he's the one who asked the ulama to write, you know, something for the, for the state as to become like constitution. And, and then they compiled this, uh, this fatawa, al fatawa al alamgiriya or fatawa al hindiya Actually, this is actually one of the best fatwas of Hanafi Madhav, or uh, at least the best uh, for, for, for India. And the ulama say every night after Isha prayer, Aurangzeb used to listen from the ulama the part that they have compiled that day. Every day he used to listen to that. You know, big team of the ulama, they did this, you know, such a pious person. You read his biography. How easily he did, Sheikh Hamasan Hindi. If Sheikh Hamasan Hindi actually has started fighting the Mughal Empire politically, he would have been crushed. He did not have power. But what he, wa he wanted to have a reform, solo reform. And that reform came actually in the shape, in the form of Aurangzeb Rahmullah Ta'ala. The more, there are actually these, these people in India, you know, Mawla Abu Hassan Nadavi, and some people like that, they say actually that two ways uh, for, 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 for Islam. One way is to bring Muslims to the power. That is no doubt the best way. But the thing in that one actually is very often conflict and fighting. So the second one is bring Islam to the power. Tell the rulers, we don't want to have, you know, we don't want to share the power. We don't want to actually to fight you. You know, you rule. We don't want. We just want actually you to follow Islam. That's all. You know, make very clear that your ambition actually is not to take power from them. You just want them actually that, you know, you, you know, they take the power, they keep the power, but take the Islam. So this actually is a new solution. That actually was, was, was done by Mawlana uh, Hassan Rahmullah Ta'ala. And, and, and people like that, and they really promoted this idea. And he wrote the whole biography of uh, Sheikh Hassan Hindi in one volume uh, in, uh, in Urdu language. So that was uh, uh, his thing. Then in India, new thing also happened later on. You know, in in uh, in eighties, 
uh, this issue started in India, Babri Masjid, the mosque you know, named after Babar, Babar the conqueror of India. In his time, you know, one of his uh, uh, governor, he built a mosque in Ayodhya. And Ayodhya basically is a holy place for Hindus. He built this mosque and somehow Hindus have been convinced that that mosque was built in the place where their Lord Rama was born. So that was the place of the birth of Rama. That actually became you know, very sentimental for Hindus. And a lot of you know, bloodshed and a lot of problems actually happened in <coughs> India. And later on, you know that the mosque was demolished and all those things happened. When this, uh, this conflict was actually on, on its height, so there was a new suggestion in India. And that was you know, uh, 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 put by some people. Among them was uh, Mawana Wahiduddin Khan, who is still alive. His idea was basically that you know, in the life of the Prophet there are many stages. You know, Makkan life, then life in Medina, and he also had Suluh al-Hudaybiya, the Treaty of Hudaybiya, that you will not necessarily all the time, you know, win the war battle by fighting, sometimes you win by treaty, by peace. So he actually has been writing and emphasizing all the time on Suluh al-Hudaybiya that we should actually take uh, that model in, in, instead of, you know, fighting people, sometimes we should be accepting actually how to withdraw from the same people don't see us and, and work uh, uh, you know, constructively uh, uh, in, in, in that, man, that manner. And that was Mawla, actually Mawla Wahidun Khan, when he presented this idea, it was not so, uh, so nicely done. And very often he became actually on, uh, in confront actually uh, uh, with the Muslim ulama and sometimes actually he also criticized them very heavily. So this idea did not become so popular, but that actually was also uh, you know, an idea which convinced at least some people uh, in India that we have to uh, follow uh, the example of the Prophet uh, in, in, in Hudaybiyyah. The thing basically is, if you look in the history of uh, all these movements, uh, you always can see that there have been problems. But at the same time, all these movements, they helped, helped the Indian Muslims in one way or the other way. Like all the Madrasa movement, they actually helped because they produced so many ulama and fuqaha uh, 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 and du'at. Similarly, Tabligh Jamaat actually helped. There are so many mosques in India, they were abandoned. They actually, you know, they rebuilt them and they really, uh, you know, the Muslim, the, and they taught a Muslim how to come and to pray. And, you know, they, they basically brought, you know, piety, a spirit of piety among Muslim masses. Similarly, Mawlam Abu Ala Maududi, Rahmanullah Ta'ala, people, you know, can criticize him for, you know, for his uh, political, uh, uh, politicizing the Islam. But at the same time, no doubt really for young people, especially, you know, educated people in the universities, you know, you can see really that how these different movements have been working, you know, in, in some, some different way. But actually, at the end of the day, they have something in common. And that we want to, to emphasize really. You know, the thing is that the difference of the conditions of Muslim, whether they are in minority or that they are majority, whether they are in weakness or whether they are in power, these conditions basically we can say like changing of the space you know, changing of the space. Space basically, you know, change the difference of the space. It is not to limit your movement. It is not like that. When you are in minority or when you are a majority or when you are in poverty or when you are actually in richness or when you are strong, you know, whatever, these are different spaces provided by your Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to limit your experience. For example, if we are actually given the choice to, to you know, what is the best space that we want really, whatever you choose for yourself, that will be very, very limited space. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why actually he keeps making people, giving people new spaces and those difficult conditions really. And he wants to see, test you, that how you can use that space uh, and make it in, in your favor. So basically, every single space that you are given, that is a new challenge for you, a new opportunity for you. It is not basically to limit you. No, it to make actually to experience something more. This is what we have to understand. Whether the Prophet was in Makkah al or he moved to Madinah Munawwara, whether it was the Battle of Badr, Battle of Uhud, Asulah Hudaybiyah. Each one basically is yeah, moving from one space to the other space. And every time the Prophet Sallallahu behaved in the same way. That you know, whatever is better, for, better in that condition, that space, that what he did. That thing has been summarized in the Quran actually in two basic terms. And that is, sometimes the Quran says, Taqwa and Sabr, innahu man yat taqwa sabr, fa inna Allah la yudiyu azal muhsaneen. Those people who do taqwa and sabr, they basically always successful. And sometimes, same thing actually called in the Quran, sabr and salah. Quran says, Ya ayyuladheen amanu, istaeenu bis sabr wa salah. And this, this verse actually in Surah Al-Baqarah. And that Surah Al-Baqarah is from Medina. So you can see even in Medina Munawwara, the emphasis basically on istaeena bis sabr wa salah. For Muslims, whether they are in minority, whether they are in majority, whether they are actually in those positions, when they think it is favorable to them, 
whether than those positions where they think really, you know, it is something negative for them. Don't worry, these are the two main things that, that people have to do. Life of taqwa, life of piety, life of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and patience. Don't protest, don't complain. Complaining is basically in the way of the weak people. The strong people, they always think now their new challenge, how I can face it, how I can find solution. If you go this way, you can't move, find another, other way. You know, if you are walking and there are mountain in front of you, if you cannot break the mountain, the way is fast actually. You know, find another way. You have to pass the mountain. The thing basically, don't cry, don't shout, don't protest. The way is found out, this is your challenge. How you can work in that? How can you make the situation in your favor? How can you make the conditions in a way that you can help and support Muslims? You know, we should not waste our time in those things. Be constructive for your people, for Muslims. Like the way the prophets and messengers have been doing. You see the prophet Yusuf Ali Salam moving from one tough condition to other tough condition until he, are, he is in the, in the prison of Egypt. He is the man who has been sold in the market of Egypt. But taqwa and piety and sabr, what makes him the person who was sold in the market of Egypt, Allah SWT makes him the master of Egypt, all that is under, under him. Taqwa and sabr, this thing is that what we need to do here really. We have to teach our children the piety, fear of Allah SWT, the prayer, that how they become good Muslim. And the second thing, be patient, be waiting, don't rush, you know, don't think it is too long. Wait, the time will come really when we will be winner. But the thing is, sabr, shouting, complaining, that is not the way of the, you know, of, of the brave people, people of courage. And that you can't find the history of the Sahaba and companions and all the people. I finished one small story and then you can see how the people have been doing. Babar, the great conqueror of India, the one who established the Mughal Empire in India, if you read his history, how he was, his father had in his, a small emirate in Central Asia, very small, just basically you can say, you know, a few, few villages. And his ba father died, Babar's father died and Babar's, and that emirate was taken by other people. And Babar was basically abundant. He had nothing to do. He cannot, he cannot take retake. He was so weak. What he did? He reorganized the people who were loyal to his father, reorganized them and left Central Asia. And then he came to Afghanistan. And actually he recently very nice that how he spent time in Afghanistan. I'm not going to detail. And then he comes new space, conquers India. You see how, the, how he had been protesting and fighting, he would have been killed. But what he did? He found no, the, the world of Allah is so open. He left, he left Central Asia and comes to India and then establish a new empire and you know, his, and for 300 years his descendants have been ruling India and at one time that was the most powerful actually, uh, empire and richest in, in the world. This is how people do. Find uh, next to every problem there is solution. Next to every problem there is solution. Think properly, use it properly and work hard Allah SWT will guide you. But if you keep shouting and protesting, you never can be guided to that solution. So, you know, I'm ending here. Let us make a dua and ask Allah SWT to help us actually in this, in this way, how, how we can guide ourselves and how we can guide Muslims in this country in a way that we can become constructive and also we can basically guide you know, the people who are around us. They have, they have responsibility, inshallah. Ameen. Okay. Rahim. <coughs> You know, this is space actually, you know, I, I've been talking about the space, the space that has been given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is very limited and very tiny. And this is space actually, whatever you want to achieve, it is limited. You know, for example, if you want an elephant or something even bigger than the elephant, it is still is, is small actually what you can achieve. If you want, you know, Islamic state, it is still actually smaller than what you can achieve in, in, in this world. You know, if you are working any space for example, you know, very often for people are like, you know, any institute, people want to become director or something like that. A few people want to become, like, you know, political uh, space, they want to become prime minister or president or king, whatever you can imagine really. It's still actually limited. Anything in this space is limited for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you ability to get something beyond that actually. Much more important than that. Even if you are giving, given the kingdom of Sulaiman Ali Salam, Sulaiman Ali Salam, you know his kingdom, you know the, the best kingdom, because he says in the Quran, Rabbi habli mulkan la yambagi ahad min baadi. Oh my Lord, give me a kingdom which is not appropriate for anybody after me. You know, we Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given ability for the people to get something beyond <coughs> this space, something better than that, something more important than that. Actually, that what is, Quran has come to teach us that thing really. It could be that you have no state. It could be actually you have no, no, no space, but still you can achieve something better than those people who have got all the space. You know, look actually, a bird, a small bird in a nest. Its space is the nest, a small, a small house. But when it's flying <coughs> in, in the morning, 
then actually the whole universe is belongs to it. House is very small, the nest is small, but the whole space it belongs to, to it. So it has a small house, but everywhere. But you know, a king, you know, in a palace, you know, his, his space is very limited. Though the people want to become king or person or whatever, look actually how, how limited his space is. But this bird which has got only a nest, it is space actually far, far bigger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us limited space, but in this limited space, what we can achieve actually far, far, you know, bigger than anybody can imagine. Because anything to this space is limited, like connected to that. On Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is unlimited. Anything that connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has basically no limit. You can reach to any extent and no, nothing can actually reach to that. And that's why I, I read one of the poetic verse on one of Indian uh, poet, Amir Khusru, who was in the, in the 8th century, he died in 725 of Hijra. Very important poet actually, he's very, you know, very much equal to Sheikh Saadi in Iran, uh, Amir Khusru. Amir Khusru says very nicely, Har do alam qeemate khud guftai nir khabala kun ki arzani hunud. You say your value is both words. This world and the hereafter. Nir khabalakun, raise your price, still you are cheap. You know, even if you get the both words, still you are cheap. You can achieve more than that actually. And that's why you can see really in, 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 in the Quran. Every prophet messenger, what they have got actually, no president, no prime minister, nobody can get. That is actually nearness to your Lord. Once you get nearness to your Lord, you become nearer to him, then not, not, nothing has got that value. And, uh, you know, I just uh, re read another poetic verse, uh, you know, because poets can say these things uh, better than anybody else. One of the poets said, Aakas ki tora shanakht, jara che kunad, farzandu ayalo khanama ra che kunad, diwana kuni, har do jahan ra bakshi, diwana etu, har do jahan ra che kunad. Whoever recognizes you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever recognizes you, jara che kunad, what is going to do his life? Once somebody knows you, Life is nothing. He can sacrifice his life actually. Nothing. That, you know, as Iqbal says, Barter than Desh hai, Sudo ziya hai zindagi, hai kabhi jaan, aur kabhi tasbih mein jaan hai zindagi. The life is beyond the concept of loss and profit. Sometimes life is to save the life, and sometimes life is to sacrifice the life. The poet says, Aankas ki tura shanakht, jara chakunat, whoever knows you, what is going to do with the life? Farzan do ayalo khanamara chakunat, what is going to do with his wife and children? And the house, diwana kuni har do jahara bakshi. You make me mad. You make me majnu in your love. And then you say to me, you are going to give me the both words, diwana etu har do jahara chukunat. The one who has become mad in your path, what is going to do with both words? You know, for the believers, actually, both words have no no price, no value. What Allah is going to give them, actually, nearness to your Lord, actually, make you so high that nothing can be equal to it. It makes you better than angels. And it really, in the whole world, become envious to it. But if we don't, we are not trying to do that. You know, to become prime minister of a country, not easy. And not everybody can become. This thing actually is so easy for everybody. Everybody can come. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the world is not narrow. Everybody can become near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not going to stop. You know, it is such an easy thing. Come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, leave everything, sacrifice everything. You know, dunya is nothing for you. Come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is going to give you actually is, even if you are poor, you know, something which actually never can be valued. And that's why, again, actually, I read Khusru's poetry and I stop it here, inshallah. When he says, Har do alam qeemate khud guftai, nir khabala kun ki arzani hunud. You say the both words are your value. Raise your price, still you are cheap. Wassalamu alaikum.